IB Nation, welcome back to the Irish Breakdown Podcast. It is a special edition of the Irish Breakdown Podcast. Sort of special, Sean, from the standpoint of the RTCF show is back. We are back with uh, the first edition of 2024. Matter of fact, Sean, it's kind of a, a cool moment because it's the first time you and I have done this show since you went through your battle. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So very excited to be going uh going with you today, but a lot to talk about today as well, man. There's uh some big news. Uh Notre Dame Nation, some big news today. Notre Dame just got a commitment from 2025 wide receiver Elijah Burris. Sean, we're going to have a lot to talk about that. We're going to then dive into just a breakdown overall of the Notre Dame recruiting board at receiver, just our overall thoughts about who they're going to take, who they're who they should take, who maybe we don't think they should take. And uh, just dive into that. Part two of today's show will be about, we're going to look at, you know, there was some stuff released this week about returning production in college football in 2024. We're going to look at Notre Dame, Notre Dame's schedule, and, and kind of ask the question, is Notre Dame's inex, you know experience level of production, is it something that could be a hindrance to any chance to make a run this year uh, at the, not, not, not so much the playoffs, but a run, a deep run into the college football playoff. And then the final part of today's show, Sean, and this is our recruiting T, their name team, CF college football. That's what the show stands for. For those who don't know, it has been a wild off season. And this week alone has just been absolutely nuts, Sean. And so we're going to kind of talk about some of the, the, the happenings in college football, Chip Kelly going to Ohio state, leaving a head coaching job at UCLA to become the offensive coordinator, Ohio state, why all that's going down. We'll talk about Ryan Grubb leaving Alabama. A lot, a lot to discuss here today, man, for uh, for, for Notre Dame and college football and all that type of stuff. But more importantly, to begin with, man, it's good to be back doing the RTCF show. It's rock and roll, man. We're starting it with the uh, first wide receiver commit in the 2025 class. And I'm ready to get to all the topics. And I'm sure we're going to have a lit chat as always. (laughs) Obviously, Sean, the big news is Notre Dame, as we talked about, got the commitment from Elijah Burst. This is going to be an interesting one, Sean, and you can already see it in the chats. This is going to be one of those ones, and it's already on the board. We've been having this battle all day. He's not ranked very high. Matter of fact, three of the four recruiting services haven't even ranked him. The one that has has him as a three-star. The um, he, he is a guy that has only three power five offers and a guy that is just – from a from a what people who don't watch film look at standpoint, not a very impressive pickup for Notre Dame. Then you look more into the film and the talent, and those things tell a very very different story. But uh, just to kick off, Elijah Burris from Wayne, New Jersey, DePaul Catholic High School, had 29 catches this year for over 400 yards, five touchdowns. Did his best work in some of their biggest moments. Had seven catches for 115 yards against Bergen Catholic. Outplayed Quincy Porter in that game, by the way. Also had four catches for 113 yards and two touchdowns in their first playoff game. And so we'll talk about that. We'll also dive into the film, uh, Sean, about this one. And, of course, you, we, we've looked at, talked a lot about DNA and genes. And one of the things, you know, again, this is Plexico Burris' son, right? Plexico Burris, first-round NFL draft pick, played in the NFL for over 10, 10, uh, 10 years, has over 10,000 career receiving yards, won a Super Bowl with the Giants. Actually, was he on both their Super Bowl teams or just the one? The one where they beat the uh, caught the game winning touchdown. No, for against, a fact, in that the one. Patriots, right? Yes, yeah, in that first Super Bowl where they beat the Patriots. And his mom, Tiffany, is a lawyer, but before that, she was at Penn State running track. She also started a, a, a clothing line for moms a, a while ago. I don't know if she's still doing that or not, but comes from a very, very obviously gifted family athletically. Mom was a Big Ten sprinter. She ran the mm-hmm. hundred meter dash indoor, you know, short sprints. Dad was an NFL football player. So, but that doesn't mean that you're going to be a good player. Michael Jordan had kids that played basketball and they weren't as good as Michael Jordan, right? I mean, no. so that doesn't mean a whole lot. But when you watch the film, Sean, you look and say that this kid is a very, very talented player. Absolutely. And the one thing that jumped out on his film when we watched it is he has suddenness to his game. I'm very interested. You know, we'll find out eventually what his 40 time is. I'm sure he'll go to a camp this summer, get timed in the 40, and those numbers will come out. When you watch his film, you see the suddenness, right? And then the stats you gave shows that his yards per catch is pretty good. And you talked about how he played against top-notch competition in New Jersey this season. So 
that lets you know that you're getting a dog in a sense. Like he does his best work against the best competition. And that's something that I think the <clears throat> coaching staff saw when they went after this young man, brought him in for junior day, and ultimately, you know, took him into the class when he was ready to commit. You talked about the DNA, the NFL DNA. He's a totally different body type than his dad. His dad is a four or five guy, right? Big body. And that's who he is. He's going to go up 50-50 balls, high point the balls, and be very physical going across the middle. Middle. But this young man, screen game, short game. But when he catches the ball, he's going to do something with it. You, He's already really good at route running. You see that in his film as well. And so those are the things that, in my opinion, were attracted to Mike Brown and the rest of the offensive staff when they were checking out Elijah Burris, is that I don't know if they have a lot of run after catch in the wide receiver room right now. And I think that's something, if you look at the offers that were put out, that's something that was linear across the board for all the wide receivers that were offered. They were really good after the catch. Elijah Burris is the exact same way. So this is a this is a good this is a good commit in the 25 class. I don't think it will be the best receiver that comes into the class. As of right has, now, as, as of right, right now. now, based on yeah, well, it, it, we'll we'll dive into the, a little bit of the backstory too, Sean, because I think what you just talked about with the type of receivers they're going after, speed and playmaking ability, we'll dive more into that even more so when we get into the part two of today's show. Uh, but when you look at this commitment, it's it's here's here's kind of why it caught people off guard. A month ago, most Notre Dame fans didn't know who this kid was. I mean, that's that's the reality of it. Most Notre Dame fans didn't know who Elijah Burris was. You know, they didn't know that Plexico Burris had a son that was a you know junior in high school and was getting offers from from schools. He doesn't have a lot of Power Five offers right now. His three Power Five, well, Power Four, I guess now, offers are Notre Dame, Duke, and uh, Cincinnati. What's interesting is that's three more offers than Brandon Hillman had at this time of his junior year. And we obviously Brandon Hillman became a, a, a top 50 player for, for or a top 150 player coming out and a guy that Notre Dame got and Notre Dame fans were excited about. So I wouldn't get too much into that stuff. And, and here's some backstory on 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 Elijah missed his whole sophomore season with some injuries. Nothing like career threatening, nothing like debilitating towards his future, nothing that can be concerned with about, about that. But it did keep him from breaking out as a sophomore and playing as a sophomore to Paul Catholic. And then when you look at uh, sort of the the kid that's in his class, who's their leading receiver, did play in 2022 and kind of emerged as the go-to guy. He was still that guy this year, but you can watch that kid's film. And this is something I would challenge Notre Dame fans to have. Don't just watch Elijah Burris' film. Go watch his teammates' film because you will see Elijah putting in work and getting open on plays where the quarterback's looking at the other kid. And so we'll kind of see how that, if that changes at all. He's also a kid that didn't do camps because of the injury. He hasn't been to a ton of camps. I think he's been to a couple, but hasn't done a lot of the camp circuit and is a guy that Notre Dame kind of found. Mike Brown was actually recruiting him at Wisconsin. That's how he, you know, that's how kind of Notre Dame got on him was Mike Brown came here and was like, Hey, I like this kid better than a lot of the kids that are on the Notre Dame board already. And so obviously there was that push. And then when the rest of the staff had a chance to watch Elijah, everybody was on board. I mean, from the minute they offered him, I I was kind of like, is this kid actually a, a take? So I reached out to some people that I know that that would know such things, and it was yeah, definitely. I mean, this if he wanted to come right now, we'd take him. And then of course he visit immediately set up a visit, and that's going to also factor into why he didn't get a lot more offers after Notre Dame offered. Because if you look around when Notre Dame offers kids, there's almost immediately follow up offers from a lot of other schools. Big reason why that didn't happen with Elijah is because as soon as people make, started making phone calls to New Jersey to find out what was going on. Everybody knew what was going on, and that was him coming to Notre Dame was a matter of 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 when, not if, at that point in time. And when you, I mean, obviously his dad played against Notre Dame, but his mom, with her her background, like I said, she's a lawyer, she's she's run a, a business. Notre Dame is a place that that family is going to be very very attracted to uh, for their son. And then of course the relationship with Mike Brown having already been established. That's the thing is, like when he was offered by Notre Dame, he didn't have a, a relationship with Notre Dame but he already had an established relationship with Mike Brown. And so it wasn't like, hey, uh, I got to get to know you guys. He already knew the guy he was going to be playing for. Now it was, hey, let me get to campus. Let me meet the other commits. Let me meet Mike, meet Mike Denbrock. Let me meet you know, some of these other guys. And it clicked really well. And then it was just pretty much, okay, when's he going to when's he gonna announce? That's basically, basically kind of what it came down to, Sean, as far as the backstory for Elijah Burrish and, and how, we, how we got here with him. 
And you love to hear that. And that previous relationship with Mike Brown extends to like the rest, some of the most, I would say some of the most explosive offers. When we talk about the wide receivers offers that went out, the kids that we look at and say, man, this kid really has a chance. I really like him. That seems to be familiar, right? Mike Brown's previous relationship when he was at Wisconsin and some even going back to Cincinnati, you know, when you reference point someone like Taylor Taylor, but I love this this commitment because I think it shows the direction that the Notre Dame wide receiver room needs to go. And I think it shows that there is an honest evaluation of what existed. I think that was an honest evaluation in the transfer portal, what they needed to get to yeah. balance out the room, to make sure the same things that popped up the previous year won't be issues this year. And then moving forward, we need more of this. Yes, in the room we need we need more run out to catch explosive plays without it having to be a deep ball per se. Right, because we're going to run the ball, and that right. means play action, crossing routes, mesh concepts, you know, quick slants, quick screens, things of that you, nature. You, you need catch and run, Sean. I mean, let's yeah. let's dive into the class impact now, right? Because that that's relevant to the class impact because that's kind of mm -hmm. you know, it's not impacting the class, Sean, is not just about landing bodies. It was when you, we talked about this with the Owen Strebe commitment the other night, right? It, it wasn't just they needed three O linemen; they needed tackles. They need the guys that can come in and play tackle. Sometimes, you know, hey, look, we got to get bigger at this position. You know, Notre Dame had a very strategic approach to linebacker and D-line recruiting when Marcus Freeman came in. It was, I want length. We need to get longer. And people ask for comps all the time. You know what my comp is for Elijah Burris? I have two. First one is a kid that played at Notre Dame a while ago as a player, not off the field. Completely different type of young man off the field. But on the field, Kevin Stefferson. Right. Who another some, some we were having a discussion today. Well, you know, Notre Dame hasn't really had any success with, you know, low ranked three star players. And I'm like, stop making every staff be responsible for what other staffs did. Mike Denbrock and Mike Brown have nothing to do with the recruiting or development that happened before then. However, Mike Denbrock was responsible for recruiting wide receivers at Notre Dame from about 2013 to 2012 to 2013 to about 2016. Go back and look at some of the best players they landed. Will Fuller was the lowest ranked player on the in the class according to ESPN for Notre Dame. He was a three star recruit on the on the on three composite list. Corey Robinson was a three star recruit on the composite list. Jalen Guyton was a three star recruit. Now he he didn't work out at Notre Dame. He went to North Texas and balled out and is still playing in the National Football League. I think he's in his fifth year playing in the National Football League with the Chargers. Right, That was a pretty good evaluation. And then the next year, he goes out and gets Kevin Stefferson. He also went and got Michael Young. Again, didn't work out in Notre Dame. Went to Cincinnati. Was a key part of that rotation at Cincinnati in 2020 and 2021 for a team that went, what, 23-2 and two during that stretch? He was also – here's an interesting stat I found out today, Sean. Michael Young was Cincinnati's leading receiver in the loss to Georgia and the loss to Alabama. You know, so played well in some big moments and was part of it. You know, the three guys that was was with. If Elijah Burris only has the career that Michael Young had, that's a success for a kid who's a three star recruit, right? But I think he has even more upside. But if you want another comp for me, Sean, and this goes back to what is Notre Dame looking to add to this class? Who's the one player on the roster that you look at and say Elijah Burris plays a lot like that kid? It's Chris Mitchell, Right. That's who it's like. It's Chris, it's same, almost identical body type, although Elijah's as thick as Chris is now. Right. Because Chris is 6'1, 175, really good vertical speed. And that's an, a part of Elijah Burris's game that I think gets masked a little bit based on the way that they play him is he has pretty good speed. Go watch him against Bergen Catholic just running. And we'll actually see that when we pop in the film a little bit, Sean. He has good vertical speed, but he's one of those guys. The thing I like is he is that get off the line and he is full speed right now. And his ability to cut and get out of breaks in a hurry right now. Because the thing that Chris Mitchell brings to the table, it's not just that he's fast. Because I don't know that I see 4-3 when I break down Chris Mitchell film like he says he is. I legit see 4-4 stuff. But, you know, 4-4 is different than 4-3. That's the difference between Chris Brown and Will Fuller. I think Chris Mitchell has Chris Brown speed. I don't think he has Will Fuller speed. You know what I mean? That's the but I'll take Chris Brown speed. But he he's fast now. Like he takes a step, he comes off the line and he gets to speed now. But he's a good route runner. He knows how to get open and he can catch and run. 
That's the big thing. And that was the point you made, Sean, is you can't just be a big play team because you hit post routes and go routes all the time. You go back and watch LSU with Mike Denbrock. They weren't throwing a ton of bombs. What they were doing is getting guys the ball where they could catch and run or catch, make one guy miss, then go. And that's something that this kid brings to the table. Now, he's got to get stronger, and we'll we'll talk about that when we when we dive into the film, Sean. But to your point, they needed guys that can do more with before the ball got there, and he brings that. He's a very dynamic route runner, and they need more guys that can do something with the ball once they get it. And when you look at the last couple classes, it's not even just this class, but they've started to go in that direction. I think Jaden Greathouse can be that kind of player. Jordan Faison's that kind of player. I think Cam Hart, Cam, excuse me, Cam Williams is that kind of player. Logan Saldate is that kind of player. And then Elijah Burris is that kind of player. So you're starting to see adding more and more of that to the table, but they also needed a guy, Sean, that just knows how to win as a route runner. And that this kid knows how to win as a route runner. As the rest of his game, and, and really it's not even his game that needs to improve, it's his body, right? That's that's the big thing that needs to, 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 to get there. And he just needs more experience because, as I said, he missed his whole soft, sophomore year. But that's what they're adding, Sean. They're adding that that dynamic, that long-legged kid. Even though he's not super tall, he's like 6'1", but he's very long-legged, which isn't surprising when you consider his dad is 6'6", and his mom's a sprinter, right? It's not a shocker that he's got kind of long legs for, for his height. But he's a kid, to me, that just knows how to make plays with the ball. And you're going to see that in the film. And, and he, he knows how to get open. And that's the big thing because Notre Dame has had to scheme guys open a lot in recent years. Right, they've needed to call plays to kind of get guys open. They didn't have guys that could just go out and win. When you watch them play Clemson this year, they just didn't have receivers that could just win off the ball. They had to kind of scheme them, and we were talking about all year, motion them and move them around to allow them to get some space. Rico Flores is a good football player. He's not a guy that's just going to act and work himself open. He's a very good route runner, but he doesn't have the explosiveness. You have to scheme into success with Rico, and 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 players like that. This is a kid to me that can go win as a route runner. And, and that's why I really like the Kevin Stefferson and the Chris Mitchell combinations. I would say he's more like Chris than Kevin as a player uh, because he's more explosive. Kevin was smooth. Chris is a little bit more sudden and Elijah is a little bit more sudden as a player, which I like. But as you said, Sean, that's the big thing. They needed this type of player in the class. And whether that's as the he ends up being the number three guy in the class or he develops in college and he becomes the best player in the class, we'll find that out. But the skill set is something that they needed. And they're going to take four receivers in this class. So it's good to kind of finally kick the door down and get one in this class. And I know it's not one that's going to excite people, Sean. I get it. I I, I do. I'm not even mad at people that, that, that are down on this one because they don't watch film. And that's fine. That's fair. If you, everybody knew how to watch film – brilliantly they wouldn't need us right i mean that that's fair i understand you see the offers notre dame duke cincinnati you see that he hasn't been ranked by certain people i get all that i'm just telling you folks you all know me well enough to know you know sean well enough to know if we thought that this was a bad take i'd tell you you know we'd tell you and there's another kid that they're probably going to take in this class with dna that works out great that i'm not as excited about if I'm going to be honest with you. And I hope I end up being wrong about that one. This kid, Sean, I mean, the first, I mean, it was first three, four plays. I'm like, how, how was this kid? And I didn't even know he was Plexico versus kid at the time. I just saw the offer and immediately went and started watching the film. So how's this kid not got more offers? He plays at a very, in a very good league. And I'm watching the film. I'm like, holy moly, this kid's legit. And then of course, Notre Dame makes the push and gets him. So, uh, from a class impact, Sean, you're kicking off the 2025 class. But as you said, and I think nailed, absolutely nailed it, you need a specific type of skill set in this class. Burris gives you that in a lot of different ways. Now, you can you you can still add that. you still room to add another player like that. But to at least get this one was big for me, for Notre Dame. And, and, and again, I understand why people aren't as excited. Some, some, some aren't excited about this. But, man, it didn't take me very long, Sean, to watch the film. To, and it was the same feeling I got when I first watched Kevin Stefferson. You remember that. I was, I mean, first time I saw Kevin Stefferson, I don't care what anybody says about his ranking. That dude can flat out ball. And he ended up being a pretty good player for me. I just want the kid to stay healthy, Brian. Just stay healthy. That's why he wasn't at camps. You talked about his health. He comes back. Production goes up a little bit. 
And then I expect his production to take another step this season. And I expect him to be on the camp circuit. So we'll see. Those are the things we're going to look for for affirmation and confirmation for what we feel he can be based upon his film. But you talk about it, and just to tie a nice little bow before we get into his film breakdown, look, you need certain things. There's a reason Notre Dame struggled last year at the wide receiver position. That's because they had a lot of the same receivers that can do the yeah. same things. And, and fit in the no, same and position. Fit in the same positions, right? So you have to recruit now to eliminate that. I'm sure, yeah, they would probably love to come in and say, yo, we have everything we need now. We can just pick and choose who we want. That's not how that's not how it works. They have to come in and evaluate what they have, what they don't have, what they're going to be losing, and honestly say, this is what we need to get. The same thing with the offensive line situation. They need tackles in this class. Point blank. And so that was paramount. And the same thing, the type of receiver and the type of skill set that this young man gives them is a need it's a need he's a great get great get we'll see if he's going to be a great player or to, to fill a need he's a great get let's dive into the film sean and, and give people a little bit of a taste for this there's also some game film online if some if you are someone who likes watching game film which i do there is some game film on youtube that you can go find just type into ball catholic football and you'll find some game film on there as well. But we're going to stick to the highlights for the purposes of this show and give you a little bit of a taste of what Elijah Burris is all about as a player, Sean. And again, this first clip kind of gives you a little bit of what we're talking about. Just that foot quickness, ability to make plays after the catch. Using, I mean, just starting off, I mean, he's using his speed, his his speed, and why speed, I mean, not coming off fast, to set this guy up. It just, this is nuance. Like, okay, this guy's kind of waiting and watching. I'm trying to time this up. This guy's not pedaling. Boom, hit that quick out, catch the ball. Now he's in space. You got to make one guy miss, and then you go, right? So you see it right off the gap. And look at that acceleration. Like, that guy has an angle on him, Sean, and he just explodes past him. This is Northern Jersey football, folks. This is good football. Now, that I, I would be on him about. Like, bro, don't you stick that ball out like that until you get into the end zone, right? But now this is a this is an example of where he does not get the football. You'll see this a lot on this other kid's film. Watch the suddenness here, Sean. Like, talking mm -hmm. about win, winning at the line. Goodness gracious. Great win at the line. What's Why is he doing this, Sean? It's because this guy is playing him inside. He needs to get inside. So what he's got to do is he's got to lean that guy out, get him to bite, then snap it off inside. Look at that quickness. Gets up field vertically. Boom. Sticks the post Wait route. Wait a minute. The, the, the go at the top of the route, though. Right. That's right. what I'm talking about. Sticks that post route. And look at the acceleration out of the break. Watch this. Boom. I mean, just he's gone. Now, he's more open than he would have been otherwise. He would have been open on this play no matter what. But he looks – it looks like the corner and the safety are like, oh, my God, I don't know what he's doing. But they're reading the quarterback, and the quarterback's looking away from him. That, that, mm -hmm. But this route gets open no matter what. Like, he, this corner's not covering him even if he wasn't reading the quarterback. You know what I mean? And so, again, you're watching this, you're watching this film and saying, yeah, he didn't get the ball. But, guys, if the quarterback is looking at that, He's going to get that ball, and it's going to be six. Yeah, I And mean, that's just that suddenness and explosiveness to get out of the route. And there's still some things you can clean up there. I want him to just kind of – he rounds it off just a skosh at the top. Yeah, You know, stick that thing and, and get a little bit more uh, downhill is good, but that's a really nice route, Sean. Really nice route. Love the ball control here. Keep that foot in bounds. This is against Bergen Catholic. Obviously, Notre Dame, Steve Angeli is from Bergen Catholic. Uh, Quincy Porter who is a kid that Notre Dame likes a lot in the class, is on this team. There's a lot of Division One football players in this on this field for Bergen Catholic, and he just runs right by dude, Sean. He ended up having seven catches for 115 yards and a touchdown in this game. Really nice tra ball tracking here. I mean, if they had a better quarterback, this should be six. I mean, he should. this should be a touchdown right here. Uh, he, it seems like he eats up the cushion pretty fast yeah. to me when watching this film. Yeah, Sean, that's that first step quickness we were talking about earlier. You know what I mean? Like yeah. he gets off the line, he gets and, and, and he knows how to manipulate speeds too, because it's not always about coming off as fast as you can. I've talked about this. I'm my rule for receivers is you're selling it like it's a go route unless I tell you otherwise, because there are there is a time and a place. I like this one handed catch here. I'd like to see him try to get two hands on the ball. You know me, old receivers coach, but this is an – he tracks the deep ball really well, Sean. Really good body control. 
and he settles down in the zone. He knows I can't keep screaming to the sideline because that cornerback's going to understand. It's coming, yeah. So you yeah. you keep – he understands the subtleties of the position, which is invaluable. For a kid to understand that going into his senior season, it's invaluable. A lot of times we watch film, Brian, and we see physical traits, physical talent, speed, quickness, breakaway speed. When you watch somebody who has film – and you as a coach, this is what brings you joy when you're watching film like mm -hmm. this because you see things that you say to yourself, those are things that I teach freshmen and sophomores yeah. in college. Mm -hmm. And this kid is working and actually executing it. As a junior in high school. As Absolutely. a junior in high school. Like this route right here, Sean, like this is just a simple slant, but you see it. He stems him up. He gets that outside lean. As soon as the guy turns his hips, you're done. And I beat you inside. But the thing is, he's got to lean here because if he just runs vertical, number one, the corner just squeezes on him. And number two, he runs right into the safety. That lean, number one, you're attacking the leverage of the corner, right? That's number one. You're using your 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 speed off the ball, not, not speed from a pure speed standpoint, but the speed that you are coming off with. You're using that to manipulate him because you're getting him to think, hey, I'm running something by you. And then, boom, you stick it inside. He sees that it's zone. And so instead of screaming inside out of a slant, he start. He beats that guy. Settles down because if he, again, if he runs full speed out of this break, he's running right into the safety. He's getting laid out. Right. This is understanding the coverage that you're playing. Throttle down. Make the catch. Brace for impact. And you got the first down. Right. Like that's. I mean, that's 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 good stuff right there, Sean. So good that's stuff. that's the ability pre snap, and then the ability to react post snap, mm -hmm. and understand what's needed. It's something similar to what people say makes Travis Kelsey great with Patrick Mahomes. The understanding of where the open area is, running to the open area, knowing when to throttle down and to give your quarterback the opportunity to get the ball to you. That's elite level type stuff when it comes to receiving and running routes. And we're, once again, we're talking about a young man who just had one gear because he was injured previously. He's doing all of this, really his first full year. Playing varsity, healthy, for sure, yeah. Playing varsity. I mean, that's impressive. I don't care if he doesn't have stars. If you show me this tape without me, me having a name, without his connection to his father, if you just show me this tape, what would I say? This okay. kid has an advanced game, that's, dude. That's what you'd be saying. That's exactly yeah. what you would say. So let's remove all the exterior factors, right? But he doesn't have a star. He's not ranked. This is his dad that can mm -hmm. go both ways. Just remove all of that and just watch the film. Right. Right. And tell that, me whether or not you're happy right about there. this young man coming to Notre Dame. Catches this is a, it with his this hands. Is a string game. Boom. I mean, you're talking about yep. suddenness, run at the catch. Get the ball outside, right? He eventually switches it, but get the ball outside, right? A little quicker than that. But this is one where it's like, hey, why don't you get the ball outside right away? Because the defender's outside. Right. You don't put the ball near the defender. And once you get vertical, Get the ball back outside, which he does, right? You see it up there. Now his now he's got the he's got the stiff arm hand open and he maximizes yardage. I mean, that's that's what you need, right? Like what Notre Dame doesn't do a lot of, Sean, is they don't steal yards like in the past game a lot. They don't. They don't steal yards. And that's what's so frustrating with like no RPO and just lack of screen game is because, you know, I mean, LSU this year, you watch them, they'll just steal six, seven yards. Boom. You play off boom, we're just gonna steal six yards. I mean, it's just like a run play. And they don't do enough of that, and and you need. But part of it is because you need guys that can do that. I mean, that's you know I'm very high on Tobias Merriweather still. I think Tobias Merriweather chance to still be a very good player, but that's not the stuff you're doing with him. You're using him to run vertical routes, and that goes back to your point. There weren't a whole lot of guys that could do that, and and the guys that they could, they didn't really use a lot for that. And so they're trying to recruit more and more guys like that. And this young man has ability to do that as a route runner, and then as you said, after the catch. And as he gets more and more playing time, Sean, to your point, you're going to see it even more and more and more. So if he takes the physical jump and the production jump that we think he has a chance to do in his senior year, you have to feel that with his skill oh. set and understanding of the position, he's someone that can come in early. Yeah, I think so. And definitely get snaps. Yeah. Now, here's another one where the quarterback just doesn't look at him. Th mm -hmm. This is in the state title game. They lost 14 to seven. Sean, this should be a touchdown. A look touchdown. At, this should be, if this is CJ Carr, Deuce Knight, Kenny Minchie, Steve Angeli, this is a touchdown. 
you know, and, and that's the thing is like you, you sometimes numbers can lie. I mean, he has this corner, this safety just screwed in. Watch this him throw is, his hands up. Yep. Now this is also Sean, I believe at MetLife. So this is on this is this is the where the Giants played. I'm pretty sure that's where they played the state title game this year. But this is just I mean, this is this is a really good high school route right here. Now I'd like to see a little bit better vertical release, vertical just get off, just come off a little bit faster. Mm-hmm. But this is this is really good, really good top end right here. His top ends are just excellent. Boom, because his body language is screaming post. That's the thing, right? Like boom, and then right. you just I mean it's done. It should be a touchdown. That should have been a touchdown. So yeah, he statistically he caught two balls for 15 yards in the state title game. But th- this was in the state that title. That could have been a touchdown. Right. Yeah. Right. So yeah, there, there's a lot to like, Sean. And I'm I'm hoping that they'll use him more this year. That's something I'm hoping that they'll do is is get him more involved and and maybe that a year under the belt and 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 because the other kids, this kid's a good football player. The kid that's in his class, they're in the same class. They're both very good football players. Use them both. And the one thing we haven't talked about is he has pretty good hands. Yeah, You see him catching the ball with his hands going across the middle yep. a lot. Mm-hmm. He's not a body catcher. He's catching the ball with his hands, a couple of one-handed catches, but – Gets over the top of the defense of, here, yeah. Yeah. This, that was against St. Peter's Prep, by the way. Yeah. Where Brandon Wimbush, Shane Simon, the Adam Eulas went. So, yeah, I think he had like three for 90-something in this game. He's a football uh, player, Brian. Yeah. He's a football yeah. player. So, one thing you'll see, Sean, obviously he's a – oh, there, look at that nod route right there. That's that's mm-hmm. nice. Sticking – selling the option, boom. And, again, he sees the safety coming over. And so, I'm not screaming in the back. I'm, I'm getting to the end zone. I'm finding that sweet spot, and I'm catching the football. Uh, quarterbacks love kids like this because, he, he first of all, he does it quickly, number one. Because you got to get into that, boom, watch him get his head around. Look how fast he whips his head around. He understands this ball is going to come to me now. I got to get my head around and catch that football. That's just, again, that's a kid that knows how to play the game of football right there, Sean. That's, that's what that is. That's why you do the cone work. Look, at it. He literally looks like he's doing cone work. Yep. Run that route. Yep. Yep. You talk about your, your head, working your head back. Look, this is a very na- – he, he's a pretty long kid, Sean. You can see it right now. He's in his stance, right? This is a good pre-snap stance, number mm-hmm. one. He doesn't have a ton of wasted movement at the snap. Nice bend in the front knee, drives off that front foot. But look how long his arms are, too. He's got a decent catch radius for a kid who's only about six foot one. I've seen some people list him as 6'2". I'd have to see him up close in person. I I don't think he's too far off of that. There's a picture of him with Marcus Freeman that that they're similar height, and he might be just maybe a skosh taller. Uh, but, uh, you know, good height. I, I don't know if he's going to hit a growth spurt. People have asked about that. I don't know if he's going to hit a growth spurt like his dad. I don't even care if he does. I mean, he's already over six feet tall. I'm good with that. Now, if he grows a couple inches, that's great, you know. Uh, but I don't think he needs it. Where, where, where you see on film, the first thing you look at, Sean, is he's got to fill out and get stronger. His play strength is going to have to get stronger. Like he's a kid that great route runner, but when he's playing against man coverage against the Benjamin Morrisons and the Christian Grays, the guy, Jade Mickey, especially, you know, guys that are older and, you know, three years in the weight room and things like that, he's going to get knocked around a little bit more. So he's going to have to improve that strength, that functional strength, that play strength as he moves forward. I'm not too concerned about it right now because he's just a junior. Right, but that is going to be something. And his dad was a string being in high school, so I, I I know that his dad was very skinny in high school as well. I played against his dad actually. Well, I was on the team that we played against this when I was at Kemsville. They beat us when I was a freshman. We beat them as a sophomore. Took my ACTs with Plex and Deion Dyer too, by the way, Sean, which is pretty funny. I have a story to tell you about that one later. Uh, but he he filled out as he got older, like his junior senior year. He as he got older, but when you go back and look at Plex when he was a freshman and a sophomore, he's a pretty skinny dude. And and so he filled out pretty well uh, and, and was a pretty strong player as well. So I think he'll get stronger. It's just that's the main area right now that I look at. And I say that's the area where he's going to have to get a lot stronger, just functional play strength stronger as he plays against better DBs. But love the quickness, love the length, love the hands, and just love the feel for the game. You all saw it on the film. I mean, that kid just knows here's the open spot. Here's when the ball should come. Like he didn't know if the quarterback was going to throw him the ball there. But he was going to be ready for it if it came, and that's those are things that you love, man. It's like that he's got all the tools, Sean. I mean, really, again, I I hope that the I hope that these recruiting services are smart enough 
to 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 be open minded when they watch this kid play because the tools are there. That's a four star football player, Sean. I don't care what anybody says. Who can I trust? That's a question that every quarterback asks when it's third down, when it's third and five. We need to move the chains. Who can I trust? This young man's the type of wide receiver that quarterbacks are going to say, I can trust him. I can trust that he's going to know where to, where to go, where the open space is. I can trust he's going to run the right route. I can trust he's going to be on time. I can trust that he's going to get off bump and run. Like if you talk about him picking up weight, gaining strength, all of that will come. But from a technical standpoint, he has a skill set that gives comfortability to your quarterbacks that they have somebody on that third down that they can trust. And that is invaluable. I don't care how talented you are as a quarterback. If you don't feel like you have somebody that you can trust, who are you going to pull the trick? When, how do you pull the trick? This young man, look, and I think he was, it's pretty safe to say his quarterback had a favorite target. A, a really good target, by the way. And that, like... that kid actually had more numbers as a sophomore when mm -hmm. Elijah wasn't on the team. He actually had over 900 yards as a sophomore, and that kid's numbers dropped down to 800 as a, as a junior because he had to split some production with Elijah a little bit. But, yes, no doubt, that, that kid emerges the top target the year that Elijah sat out, and that's a factors into it, into what they're doing. And you can watch the film. They're putting that kid to the field a lot, the other kid to the field a lot. Well, in college, you're going to be thrown to the boundary more. In in high school, you're going to be thrown to the field more. And that's yeah. where they went with the ball a lot of times. Yeah. So, a lot, lot to like, Sean. A lot to like about this young man. We're going to wrap up this part of it because we're not going to do sort of the what's next part that we normally do because that's actually going to be the second segment of our show. We're just kind of look at the wide receiver board a little bit before we dive into the Notre Dame team, Sean. But uh, before we do that, everybody, do us a favor. Hit that like button. Hit the subscribe button. Hit the notification bell. Share this podcast. Give us a five-star review. If you are just a YouTube or a Rumble listener, you can also listen to our shows on podcast platforms where we actually will break them into segments. So like today's show will probably be split into three or four different segments that we'll put up. And you can find that at Spotify, uh, Apple Podcasts, any of those platforms that you use. Subscribe there. Uh, leave us a five-star review there. Greatly appreciate that. You can check those out as well. And, of course, as always, sign up for the message boards at boards.arsbreakdown.com. So just want to explain real quick, too, Sean, um, for people that are asking about my background, I'm actually upstairs in my reading room because I decided I didn't want to go over to the uh, house today and do it from the un undisclosed location. I can't do it in the basement because we no longer have a living room, a kitchen, a dining room, or a basement anymore. It's all torn up vince was over here a little bit ago he was like what the heck um so about five more weeks of that but that's why i have uh this background i'm not being like that guy you know i want to be like sean and everybody else i don't have the books and everything in my background although this is i think kind of a nice little background but uh that i just want to explain to people that's and, and so this will be where i'm doing a lot of the weekend shows from so just want to let everybody know that before we get started in the next section so why don't you and uh, sean and, and kick us off for part two all right we're going to get into the team part of this show each and every week receiver board receiver board yeah, yeah, yeah. too yeah yeah and, and to start that off we're going to talk about the wide receivers <laughs> in the board and what's left we know there are a lot of offers that went out when new wide receiver coach mike brown arrived at notre dame we saw what we thought brian was immediate impact in the urgency with which the wide receivers played with in the sun bowl against oregon state so it gave us a feeling that okay they're they're lending their ears to what they're hearing from Mike Brown, and it's having an instant impact. And now we wait to see who becomes the domino or the next domino to fall in the wide receiver room, what's left on the board, what might Notre Dame be thinking as far as how they look at these guys and who might be a guy that they take right now or another guy that if he comes down the line they might be interested in taking, who might they be waiting on a little bit to see Let's get them on campus or let's see a little bit more film or let's see them in camps. All of these things are factors to see how the board is going to play out. And will they take four wide receivers in the class? Might they bump it up to five? Yeah. Because this might be a larger class. These are all the things we're about to talk about to start yep. the team second. It's going to be interesting, Sean, when you look at the receiver board. And, and because for a while there, they were talking about just taking three. And I was a little nervous about that because they were going to take 
Jerome Bettis Jr. in the class. And I got a little nervous about that if you're only taking three. Plus, you look at the roster, you got to think about this. When this class shows up, Jaden Greathouse, Jordan Faison will be juniors. I mean, so that's kind of how, how fast this whole thing happens. I talk about that all the time. And, and so you are going to need some guys that can come in and kind of help you out in year one and year two, to a degree. Not necessarily year one per as much, but definitely by year two, because by year two, you may not have Jaden Greathouse anymore if Jaden Greathouse is as good as you and I think that he is. And you may not have Jordan Faison or some of those other guys. And so, and and then also it's about complementing what is there before. And this is something that I think we need to focus more on of our conversations is it's not just about landing the three best guys that you like every year. It's also about, okay, but am I complementing my receiving core the way it needs to be? And Notre Dame went through a period like that where, you know, part of the reason I felt the receiving core was was so underutilized is because I thought they did a great job of, of bringing in different types of players, but then they didn't use them the way they needed to. So when you look at like the 15 and 16 classes that Mike Denbrock put together, in the 15 class, you had Equinemi St. Brown, big, tall, long, vertical guy, Miles Boykin, big, tall, long, vertical guy, Jalen Guyton, Six foot, six one, route runner, not dynamic athlete, but just knew how to play, knew how to get open, knew how to make catches. He was Kyler Murray's top receiver in high school. And then you got CJ Sanders, short, shifty type of player. Then you look at the next year, you get Ch Chase Claypool, big, tall, physical, freaky kid. Javon McKinley, six two, knows how to play the game, great ball skills. And then Kevin Sefferson, again, vertical, shifty. So you had a lot of different type of skill sets. And then there was a period of time where it felt like they weren't doing enough to kind of build the roster the right way. And, and so you're, you're seeing them get back to that a little bit more. And you look at what's left in the 2023 class. You've got Jaden Greathouse, who's 6'1". He'll be 2'10", 2 2 when it's all said and done. Just a playmaker. Just knows how to get open. Knows how to play the game. More of a slot field guy. You've got Jordan Faison from that class, who's a slot field guy as well. 5'10", shifty, good speed. Knows how to play. Tough kid. And you've got K.K. Smith, again, slot guy to field guy, shifty, smooth athlete, really good player, like him a lot. And so then you say, okay, well, you know, you, you don't have Braylon James, or you had Braylon James at the time, Rico Flores, but Rico was kind of a slot field guy too. Braylon was really the only true, no doubt about it, outside player. So then in 2024, what did Notre Dame focus on? We need to make sure we get some longer outside receivers. Cam Williams. Micah Gilbert, and then not give up on some of those other things. You see them get Logan Saldate. But before Logan, remember, then Isaiah Canyon, who was another long outside guy. And so they started to kind of restock that. So they were still very much in a, just positionally, we had to recruit certain guys to fill out so we could have a guy that can play the boundary, a guy that can play the field, instead of having a bunch of guys that are slots that we're trying to develop into something else. And so they did that last year. Now it's more so about you have to make sure you're continuing to balance that, Sean. But now it seems the focus is more on traits and skill sets, more so than we need an X, we need a Z, we need a slot. It's more so we need this type of player. And so when you look at, for example, when we talk about Elijah Burris, what does he fill? He's an outside guy that could be also a pro-style slot but projects more as a, as a Z that is a route runner, you know, stretch the feet. I think he stretches the field pretty well. Now I think he's faster than some people give him credit for I, I do think he runs pretty well and he's going to get faster as he gets older. And he's now another, he's going to be another, he's thinking about this. He's going to be another year removed from the injury that cost him his entire sophomore season. Remember how much more athletic and explosive Kingston Villam also looked as a senior when he was a, now another full year removed, from the injury that cost him most of his sophomore season, right? And so that's something to think about as well. But, you know, he's kind of that outside guy. And then what else do you want in the class? They want a big guy that can stretch the field. There's two guys on the board for them right now that do that. Derek Meadows, Quincy Porter, very different players, but in certain ways, but that's what they are. There's those, those boundary 6'4 to 6'6 six, six type of guys We'll talk about Derek Meadows more specifically in a little bit, Sean, because that's a guy the staff is on. Jerome Bettis Jr., another outside guy, a big physical kid, 6'3", over 200 pounds. You know, just a, more of a volume possession type of guy. Doesn't show the kind of speed or ability to separate to be that 
downfield guy right now. And then after that, it's like, okay, well, then what else do you want in the class? And I think what Notre Dame is going to look for as sort of that fourth option, Sean, is, okay, they want to they want a really shifty, explosive, make plays with the ball in your hands guy, where that is his primary trait. And I think that's what the staff desires as the makeup of this class. But here's my question, and this is what's going to make it very interesting. I zero problem taking Elijah Burris. Love this pickup. I have no problem with Notre Dame taking Derek Meadows and it, because he's very raw as a receiver. Only had 15 catches as a junior. And like eight of those were touchdowns because they basically Bishop Gorman just threw him fade routes in the, in the red zone all day. And you're going to take potentially take Jerome Bettis. Now, it's not a given they're going to get Derek Meadows. I mean, Bama's offered recently. Florida's offered. George, I mean, everybody's offered him. It's not a given you're going to get him. But that's obviously their top boundary target. The question, though, is this class, it seems to me, Sean, and I'm curious if you feel the same way, that in a lot of instances, they're prioritizing potential and upside much more than they're prioritizing how good guys are right now. And that could end up being a really good thing, or it could be something that bites them in the butt a little bit. I don't know the answer to that, Sean, but that's the first thing that stands out to me when when I get beyond, I, I I don't know if you agree with this is what the types they're looking for, but then also your thoughts on, you know, they they're, they're just seem to be more content to fill up with kind of projectable guys. And even to a degree, Elijah Burris is a bit of a projectable guy just because he still has to get stronger and, you know, gain more experience. But it's going to be interesting to see how they fill this class out, Sean. Like, I, I, like waiting to get two of the top dudes that we like, I don't know that that's necessarily something that they're going to do in this class. And, and and then next we'll debate whether or not they should, but just overall thoughts on that, Sean. It's a nuance, right? You know, I'll just use a basketball reference where you have a team like Denver that is not overly talented when it comes to stacking them up against other rosters. But when you talk about the talent that fits with their best player and his skill set, now they become a world championship team, right? Because you get a KCP, you get a Jamal Murray that might not be a guy where you just clear out at the point guard, just let him do his thing. But you get him in a bunch of pins, pin downs, pick and pop, pick and roll action with Jokic pretty much facilitating the offense. Now you open up his game even more. So when you start talking about putting together a wide receiver room and you start adding gifts and talents, you're looking at it as a, st- as a staff to say, yo, we have some really good pass catching tight ends. How do we unlock them? How do we allow them to unlock us? Because we want to run the ball. So we're looking for play action. What can we do off of that play action? Screen game. If everybody's in the box to stop the run, we're popping the ball outside. So we need guys that can run after the catch. This is how we elevate the passing game. This is what we, how do we elevate Notre Dame's passing game? The simple things. Just, yo, they got nine in here. The advantage is out there. Right. It's the same thing. Read and react. That's what the Denver Nuggets do very well. They don't overwhelm you with talent. They know how to read and react and use what they have to defeat the way you're defending them. It's the same thing with putting together a wide receiver room. It's not like Ohio State. It's not like LSU, where they can just go overwhelm you recruiting wise in the wide receiver room every year. Notre Dame is not going to be able to do that. They have to be smart going out to build a wide receiver room that can be just as effective make big plays and be able to play off of what you have in the tight end room and the run game and an offensive line, which is what Marcus Freeman wants to do. We talked about LSU. You would think the way they threw the ball around, the yardage that Jaden Dames put up, you would think, my God, they had to run the ball maybe, what, 43 44% of the time? No. You know, even if you add in Jaden Daniels' runs, they ran the ball like 48, 49% of the time, right? So that gives you an inkling of Mike Denbrock being able to have balance within the offense and then play off of all the talents he has within that offense to magnify and be efficient in the run game. And if I'm not mistaken, Logan Diggs, he led the nation in yards per rush, if I'm not mistaken, at like 6.2 or something like that. Uh, not not generally the, the nation, because Audric, yeah, SEC, yeah, because yeah. uh, Audric had more than that. But yeah, I think I'm pretty. I, I think you could be right, Sean. I'll go look at this. As far as like eligible guys that are eligible of running backs, 
Jalen yeah. Dan- Jaden Daniels, I think, led the league in rushing yards per attempt. But I'm talking about, yeah, but I'm running, talking about running, yeah, back. running backs. Yeah, I believe but that that just that. shows you you build a room around what you have. They identify, okay, this is our board. When these kids get here, who are the rest of the guys that are going to be here? Who do we estimate is going to be the anchor in the wide receiver room that we're going to build everything around? Mm-hmm. Okay, it's going to be this guy. This is his skill set. This is where he's going to be. He's going to be a boundary guy. He's going to be a – okay, so off of that, we know these are the skill sets we need to get in this particular class and that particular class to be able to function within everything that we're trying to do. Like you said, Ohio State, perfect example. They went out and got, what, three of the top six wide receivers last year? Right. And they had a problem developing them, and they had the same problem Notre Dame had. Too. All these guys are pretty much the same. Right. <laughs> the right. same thing. Go ahead. No. LSU led the league in rushing 6.2 yards per yeah. carry. Not okay. Logan wasn't at 6.2, but but they led the league in 6.2. So the that's league. that's where the 6.2 came from. Uh Sean, when, when to your point, like you you said something interesting at the beginning, and and, and I want to I want to nuance it a bit and see if you agree with me on this. Where I think that you're somewhat uh, where you're, you're on point is Notre Dame's not going to go out there and do on the recruiting trail very often what Ohio State does regularly, which is uh, not regular. I mean, somewhat regularly, which is put together the Cardinal Tate, Brandon Ennis, Noah Rogers, all top 50 to 60 guys in the country receivers. I just don't know that that's going to be in the cards. What Notre Dame needs to do, but that doesn't mean that they can't have an elite receiving core on the field. What Notre Dame has to always do when it comes to receiver play, because again, there's a lot of things going against them. They're never going to throw the ball as much as other programs. They're never going to throw the ball as much as Lincoln Riley's offense. They're they're, they're just not. They're not going to throw the ball as much as, as certain other other teams. Or, you know, when Josh Heupel has his offense going, their name's never going to put up the passing yards that Tennessee's going to put up. There's not. That's not what they're trying to do. But so they're also a lot of the best receivers are where they're they're far away. They're in Texas, California, Florida, Georgia, Louisiana. So when you do get Northern guys like a Chase Claypool, like a Michael Floyd, like an Elijah Burris, you've got to land those guys. But what you have to do is you have to be good evaluators. And this is what I think a lot of people don't understand is, is that Notre Dame has to be, they're not going to, well, Ohio State does this. Okay, so what? Ohio State's offense or, you know, still ended the season the same place Notre Dame did, sitting at home, watching the national championship game on television. Right. And to your point, part of the reason that they struggled against Notre Dame throwing the football in most instances, is because, as you said, they have all the same guy and Notre Dame can pretty much cover that kind of guy. They didn't have that guy that could do things a little bit differently. But to me, Notre Dame can put together a top five of receiving court if you have good evaluators. And that's been lacking. And I'm seeing a lot of people saying, well, you know, Notre Dame hasn't had success recruiting three stars and developing this. I'm like, you you can't keep saying Notre Dame and act as if it's like the, the school is developing the players or the same coach that had those issues is the same guy here, right? You can only evaluate my – you can't look and say, well, Notre Dame's going to be this because that's what they were last year because they don't have the same receivers coach or the same offensive coordinator. Now, we that doesn't mean we know what they're going to do. My point, however, is Mike Denbrock showed a track record of identifying – high upside guys that weren't ranked real high. Miles Boykin, Chase Claypool, Kevin Stefferson. He was on all those guys before they blew up and became highly ranked. And some of them never blew up and became highly ranked. Corey Robinson, Will Fuller. I mean, Will Fuller was a three-star recruit. Rivals is the only outlet that had him as a top 250 player. That's it. Everybody else had him ranked really low. As I said earlier, ESPN had him as the lowest ranked player in the class. They not only recruited him, they flipped him from Penn State. They thought so highly of him that they were going to try to get him from another school. And so the current coach, as the OC, has that track record because I don't think they're going to go out there and get Cardinal Tates and Brandon Ennis's and Jeremiah Smith's with any regularity. Occasionally they will. There's going to come along a Cam Williams, and when that kid is in your backyard, you have to get him. But you've got to you've got to be good evaluators because you've got to find the Elijah Burrises, the Kevin Steffersons, the Chase Claypools. Because again, Chase Claypool kind of emerged as a as a guy that was much higher ranked. He was I don't believe anyone had him as a top 100 player. 
even though I think we would all agree that he developed into a top 100 caliber player, certainly. But his highest ranking was rivals at 109. ESPN had his number 159. 247 didn't even think he was good enough to be in their top 247. They had him as the number 48 receiver in the country coming out of high school, right? But the talent was obvious. It was, he's raw. Can he play American football? We don't know the answer to that, right? But the talent was obvious. Kevin Stefferson, same thing. They could look past that he wasn't real tall. He wasn't real big. He wasn't highly ranked. He didn't have a ton of offers, but they said the film, Sean, was big time. That's what they saw. Jalen Guyton, you know, a lot of people didn't like, not, a lot of the big time Texas schools didn't go after Jalen Guyton, even though he was Kyler Murray's top receiver. We well, didn't have great this. He doesn't have great that. So I actually think Mike Denbrock showed a track record of identifying really good football players. Some of them were ranked high. Equinemius was a relatively highly ranked player, right? There, Javon McKinley was a pretty highly ranked player. They went out and got some guys like that, but did a really nice job of finding those high upside guys that developed into studs. And if they had better coaching, the receiving core would have been a lot better. That's the whole point. Like we, we, if you had a better coach in 2017, when you're playing Georgia, it's not EQ, Cam Smith, Freddie Canteen, and Chris Fink you're trying to beat Georgia with. It's EQ, Chase Claypool, Miles Boykin, it's Javon McKinley. It's those guys that you would have been trying to beat Georgia with. But they didn't have the coaching because Denbrock was gone at that time and Dell Alexander was here. He wasn't good enough to develop them. He wasn't much of a recruiter or an evaluator. You look at, at Chancey Stuckey. Did a nice job his first year. I thought the evaluations were good, although Tommy Reese had a big role in making Cam Williams the top target, if we're going to be honest about that. And and uh, and and other guys liked – I mean, Chad Bowden and some of the other coaches were pushing for the Micah Gilbert. Chad Bowden's the one that pushed for the Logan Saldate one more so than Chancey Stuckey, if we're going to be completely honest about that. But this coaching staff is better at evaluating that, in my opinion. Now – we have to be able to judge and evaluate, okay, is that the right makeup, though, with, with certain classes? And there's going to be years where they do get more highly ranked guys, like last year with Cam Williams and Micah Gilbert to a degree. But this year, it looks like they're going to be content taking guys that maybe aren't as highly ranked, but they see high upside with Elijah Burris. Derek Meadows, to me, is this year's Chase Claypool. And, and just that really freaky athletic guy that doesn't know how to play football yet. You know, and you're you're banking on that we can teach him how to play football. We'll see if you can or not, right? But it took Chase a couple years. There aren't a lot of six foot five, two hundred fifteen pound kids that run four fours that can't really do a whole lot as a freshman like Chase could. Chase wasn't really to help ready to help you much as a freshman in 2016. He just wasn't. He knew how to play. And then over the next couple of years, learned more and more and more. That's Derek Meadows. So I'm okay taking a flyer on a guy like that as long as people understand who he is. He's not. Maybe he gets better as a senior, but he's not a guy that comes in right now and is Michael Floyd the minute he steps foot on campus. So the question is, is that the right strategy? And that that's, to me, something that is worth talking about. My my counter my counter arguments are this, Sean, and I'm curious which one you come down on. The, the argument for this strategy is you had a lot of high floor guys in the last two classes, right? Jordan Faison already showed he's ready to play as a freshman. Jaden Greathouse showed he's ready to play as a freshman. K.K. Smith, you don't know yet, but they really liked what they saw from him. I'm, I heard a lot of people raving about what K.K. Smith did in bowl prep, which is the first time they saw him, really, since he got here. Just like, this kid's really good. And then, of course, Cam Smith and Micah Gilbert are super high floor guys as well. Now, they have higher ceilings too, but you know what I mean, like high floor guys. Yeah. So you look at the last two years, and Logan Saldate is a kid that the staff likes a lot. You have six players on scholarship from your last two classes that are all ready to play, like, now. The, so so I think the staff strategy, and again, we can debate whether this is right or wrong, is because we feel good about where we are there and we've shown the ability to go out there and get portal kids like Chris Mitchell and Bo Collins and guys like that, we're willing to take some risks. I don't call them flyers because they're not fly. It, it's it's not taking a flyer on a guy who's 6'6 and runs a 4'5 and jumps 40 inches. It's not a flyer. It's not a flyer taking Plexico Burrs' kid who who shows the athleticism. It's, there's some risk, though. Can Elijah develop the strength needed to be an every down receiver? Can Derek Meadows learn how to play football and not just be a freaky athlete and be a track guy trying to play football? I don't know. Is Jerome Bettis's DNA going to kick in and, and he kind of grows into his body and gets more coordinated and explosive and takes that next step like Bryce Young did? I don't know. But it seems to me that they're more willing to take some of those risks in this class, Sean. 
That's the positive. Now, the negative is if you if your success rate isn't as high, and when you do take more risks, this is the fairer thing to say, you are going to have a higher bust rate when you take more flyers. If the kids in front of them don't pan out or have injuries or you lose them to the portal, now you're kind of back to where you were a couple years ago where you just weren't, you didn't have a receiving core that was developed enough and ready to play. So that's the risk reward behind this strategy, Sean. And I'm, I'm not sure right now quite how I feel about it just yet, to be completely honest with you. Well, I'm settled into taking an approach of wait and see, but I'm leaning more to the side of, hmm, okay, I think I see where this is going. And I'll ask you a question. See, this, I'm, I'm podcast PG for a reason. I'm, I'm setting you up right here, bro. Fair to say that Rico Flores was a four-star yeah. that most Notre Dame fans liked? Yeah. Right? I did. Yeah. Had him as yeah. top 150 caliber yeah. player. Yeah. What was one of the biggest issues with the wide receiver room? No one could get off press coverage in yeah. big games and no one could separate, right? No. Right. Did Rico fall into that even though he was a four star? He was he was the poster boy of that. Oh, in my opinion. Oh, did was yeah. Rico like one of the biggest causes for interceptions? When oh, it comes yeah. to like 50 50 balls, but everybody yeah. loved him, right? Everybody loved Rico. Right. Going into a big game where you know you're going to face defensive backs. They're gonna press you. Who would who skill set would you rather have, Rico or Mr. Burris? Oh man, that's a here's why that's a tough one, Sean. Here's why that's a tough one. I would lean towards Elijah, but here's why I'm not as 100 percent sold on that. Because the one thing about Rico, why he was allowed to be savvy as a why he was able to be successful as a freshman is Rico is strong. Yes, like he was a strong kid. To your point. And Rico's a very good route runner for his age. Now, he there's a lot of nuance he had to learn, and that's what cost him the interception against Pitt. That safety's high. You've got to level it off. Sam mm -hmm. thought you are going to level it. You sail, you, you, you took off behind. Guy steps in front. All right, okay. I mean, we talked about the time. You can't make that mistake, right? Like, that's part of the learning process. Rico wasn't going to do that again. And, and so there were some mistakes like that, but Rico was at least physically strong enough that you could go out there and, and he could block. You know, he could kind of muscle his way open and against zone and things like that. But to your point, Rico really struggled against teams that played man coverage this year. Now, with Elijah, he's got the speed and route running ability, the suddenness. The, he also he can match Rico for savviness. Rico just had more experience and, and a lot more production, way more production. So I, you, you, you got to give him that. Absolutely. This kid, to me, however, uh, Rico also played with the Division One quarterback, you know, the kid that's now at Alabama. Mm -hmm. and, and so, but that factors in as well. But is Elijah right now strong enough to win off the line? Right. Cause like I can beat you, but if I get it, if I get up, if I beat you at the line and I'm having, and Cam Hart's checking me, or if I'm getting checked by Denzel Burke or Kool Aid McKinstry or Terry and Arnold, even if I beat you initially, if I'm not, if I don't have good play strength, you're going to knock me off course. And now we're back to where you are. It's just for a different reason. But if I had to bet on it, I would probably lean, I would lean towards Elijah, Sean, because I feel like mm -hmm. that's why I pay Lauren Landau all that money because mm -hmm. it's, it's going to be a little easier for me to get Elijah stronger than it's going to be for me to make Rico faster is the way I kind of look at it. And, and that yeah. is my, that is my point. Give me that. Because we're talking about this is what we're going to face in big games and championship college football playoff games. These are the defensive backs we're going to have to beat. Give me the decision between the two. It doesn't matter how slight of the margin. I'm going to lean towards Elijah's skill set. Because like you said, I'm going to assume that, yo, he's going to be able to get stronger. This is why Lauren Lando was brought in. Right. I don't how much faster can Rico get? How much more explosive can he get? Yeah. I'm not using Rico in the screen game like that. I'm I can I, use this. I'm game. using Rico. Rico is on the field for me every time I'm running the screen. He's just my lead blocker. Exactly. Because he is and, and that's not a disrespectful comment at all. That that kid was a really good blocker for yeah. Notre Dame this year. Really good blocker. But to your point, I'm not throwing him the ball in that situation. Not mm -hmm. at all. 
because he's also not an elusive guy. We saw this this year. He got stuck a couple times. He's not a make you miss kind of guy. He, Rico is one of those guys that's going to do great work before and up to the point to catch point, right? As far right. as route running and body positioning. And, and that's where Rico would have got even better and better and better as he got older, as he would have had some of the mistakes he made as a young guy, he would have learned from and been better at, at Notre Dame. There's no doubt. It, like, like I, I think, I think sometimes I get kind of, I think people take me, take a kind of a look at me and say, Hey, um, you're not high on Rico. And I'm like, no, I'm high on Rico, but I have a better understanding of who he is than I think a lot of Notre Dame fans do. Absolutely. A lot of Notre Dame fans look at Rico and like, Oh, he was this dude. And it was a big, it wasn't really lost. He caught that many balls because he got fed the ball more than anyone else at the receiving court by a lot. They kept throwing to him. Mm. And, and, and so to me, that was part of it, but, it's more so just having a healthy understanding of who Rico was. And Rico was a kid that was eventually going to be a guy that was going to be great. He was going to be a volume guy. He's going to be great against his zone. You know, as he got a little bit better with some of his route technique as for the college level, he was going to get a little bit better at separation, but he always had a very low ceiling. The floor was really high. Rico wasn't going to get a whole lot better. We said this when he was in high school, he's going to be arguably the most ready to play as a freshman. But whereas I think Jaden Greathouse gets a lot better. I don't think Rico is going to get a whole lot better. And, and so to me, like, but he was a up before and up to the Kench point guy. What I think guys like Cam Williams bring to the table, what Elijah Burris brings to the table, what Taylor Taylor brings to the table, who's a top target is they are guys that can do damage before and up to the catch point, but they're guys that can also do things after the catch. Yes. And that's what they haven't had a lot of. And I actually think Jaden Greathouse is pretty good at that. Like he's a very under, uh, appreciated after the catch guy. And I would hope, I hope that Mike Denbrock does more to get Jaden the ball in those situations yeah. this year, which they couldn't really do as a boundary guy when they had to put him over there. But he's a guy that I think when you look at what Jaden did as a fresh, as a freshman, before they moved into the boundary, he was, he was a guy that knew how to get open and then he could catch and keep going and find that space. And he could make guys miss. We didn't see him get a chance to make guys miss, but you go watch him in high school. Kid had four punt returns for touchdowns. against really good competition as a senior in high school. Yeah. Right. And and so that's what they're at. It's Logan Saldate has some of that to his game. Cam Williams has some after the catch ability. Cam's not a shaky make you miss guy, but he's a sudden guy that if he cuts and you don't get a clean shot on him, you're not catching him until he slows down three yards into the end zone. Right. That's yeah. the, the best chance you have of getting him. And they need so much more of that. And and so that's where some of the the um of what I really like about Elijah Burris is because I do think he adds both. And for way too long, and we've talked about this a bunch of times, <laughs> Notre Dame was adding too many guys that were before and up to the catch point impact players. Yes. Which is great. You need those. But not enough guys that were after the catch. That's what made Michael Floyd so good. Because Michael Floyd was great up to the catch point. But Michael Floyd had that weird gallop. He could do stuff after the catch. Gold Tate was great after the catch. Right? Will Fuller was... Good after the catch in 2014. They didn't do as much with him in 15. He was just because he just was running by everybody. There wasn't a need to run a bunch of screens with him like he did in 2014 because nobody could stop him from just running by you. Right. So I, and, and you had a different quarterback in 2015 than you had in 2014. Where in 2014, yeah. Everett was about, you know, get the ball out quickly, being accurate. Where in 2015, it was you had Malik and then Deshaun, who were big armed, vertical throw the ball downfield guys they weren't going to be throwing 40 passes a game like ev did in 2014 that's the reason you saw the difference but will could do that in a similar fashion that i think cam williams could do that which is catch make one guy miss and then just pew, be fashionable because w- w- we remember all the verticals that will caught in 2015 but remember he had the screen touchdown against lsu mm-hmm. he had the screen touchdown where he caught it to the left and then cut all the way back against syracuse and scored out the back door do you remember that yeah. That game where Ev completed like 20-some balls in a row. He had a screen touchdown against Northwestern. So they did a lot more of that in 2014 with, with Will. And I think that Cam Williams can be that kind of player. And it, it, because Cam has that true home run speed that Elijah doesn't have. I think Elijah's faster than some people think. But Elijah's not Cam Williams fast. He's not Will Fuller fast. I think his game is a lot like Chris Mitchell. Somebody said he's not as fast as Chris Mitchell. He's not as what fast as what Chris Mitchell is right now because Chris Mitchell's a fifth-year senior and and Elijah's a junior in high school. I think he will be 
when it's all said and done. And if I'm right on that, and he does take that speed jump sophomore, junior year, perhaps in college, that's going to make him even more dynamic. And now he could maybe become like a true number one at that Z, whereas right now he's more of that route runner after the catch complimentary player to Cam, to Micah, to Jaden, and guys like that. And that's kind of the question I have, Sean, is unless they're able to land like Taylor Taylor, mm. I don't know that there's right now that number one dude in this class because I think Derek Meadows is going to be more of a, you know, 40 catch at best, 40 catch, 800 yard guy as opposed to a 70 catch every down volume guy. Now that's good. He's more Alvin Harper for the Cowboys. Not a number one, right. not a go to, right? Just, He's a freak, right? Yes. Yes. I just want Mike literally. Mike Denbrock just had one of those dudes. Had a co- yeah, yeah, Brian the Thomas, Thomas Brian Thomas, yeah. Yeah, so he's not as thick as Brian Thomas is. That's a good call. But like yeah. and and he's not he he doesn't have the volume game right now that Brian Thomas had. But but to to so I'm trying to think of like some comparisons like he's just not a volume guy. He's going to be he's not a number 1 go out there we need you to catch nine balls guy. He's a guy that's going to catch the ball three or four times for 100 yards. Right. And so who is that number one in this class? I don't know that there is that unless they're able to land a Taylor Taylor or, you know, a guy like that. I, I don't, they're just, that's my concern is there's not a lot of those guys on the board, you know, Raiden Vines bright. I, I don't know that he's that, you know, I don't know that Lex Cyrus is that, although I love the skill set that Lex Cyrus brings to the table, give me him in a heartbeat. And the, and the speed. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so to me, unless Elijah Burris becomes that, and I actually think he has a chance to be that he's just not there yet. That's one of my concerns with the the current board is if they if they don't hit on a couple guys, then then it's going to be a bunch of really nice complimentary pieces. But at the end of the day, Sean, that's not necessarily bad. You always want to land a dude every year, but that's not necessarily bad because you just landed a couple dudes in back to back classes, in Jaden Greathouse, and then Cam Williams, and we've already seen you know Jordan Faison step up as kind of a, an impact guy. And I think Micah, Micah Gilbert can bring some of that to the table. So I, I kind of understand the strategy, Sean. And, and and if you take out any context, I don't know that I love it. But in context of where they are and the specific skill sets that they are targeting, I actually get it. Right? I, I do. I just – I don't know that I would do it the same way. I would, I would have a little bit more of a broad board for some of the top-level guys. I wouldn't push as quickly maybe for a, for a couple guys. But I understand what they're trying to do. And if they can hit the inside straight, you know, which means, you know, get a Derek Meadows, get a Jerome Bettis Jr., different stop story for a different day. Just that's just the where it's going. Now you've got to give me a a, a Taylor Taylor, maybe a Lex Cyrus as that that final piece. Yeah. That 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 to me is that's gonna ultimately determine how how smart this strategy is. Because I totally get Derek Meadows, totally get Elijah Burris, even understand Jerome Bettis Jr., even though I don't necessarily agree with it, I get it. So this class is ultimately going to be defined by what's that number four guy. Not number four in the the order of the fourth best player, but I'm more timing. Who's that final piece of the puzzle? That ultimately is going to tell us if this is a high ceiling but risky class or just a really good freaking class. Yeah. Because if you add a Taylor and Taylor to the mix, now all of a sudden I'm like, all right, cool. It's a heck of a receiver class. Mm-hmm. Three years in a row, great receiver class. So um, it's going to be interesting to see how that part of it plays out. And it's it's funny because it plays into you know the chat great as always. And I'll drop this tidbit because you know you know I just spoke with Deuce Knight recently, and I flat out asked him. I said, "Yo, with all of these new offers, have you been checking out film?" And he said, I've checked out a couple of them, but he said, honestly, I believe in the talent evaluators on the coaching staff. Those his exact words. He believes in the talent evaluators on the coaching staff. And he said, one of the reasons I do that is because I went to LSU when Mike Denbrock was there on a visit and had a conversation with him and listening to him talk to me about the quarterback and the wide receiver position. He said, I told the coaches, Man, let them Brock talk mm-hmm. to the receivers. Let let him talk to some of these receivers 
when they come in for visits because I've, I've heard the pitch myself right. when I went to LSU. And that's that's the quarterback in the 25 class. So when people are talking about this is what they're giving him, he's good with it. Yes. Because he trusts the coaches. Right. Well, the person saying that's a is a star rankings obsessor. So it, no, it doesn't I mean, matter. Just in general. No, I'm just it, it just it doesn't it matter. Today. Yeah, they're just gonna look and see it and no oh, star this and star that. Like, yeah, Deuce Knight's gonna be like, they just landed Plexico Burris's kid. All right, cool. Sign me up. You know what I mean? And then the staff's gonna tell him what this kid is made of. Oh shoot, why are they gonna give him a six foot six guy that runs a four five flat as a sophomore junior in high school and can jump 40 inches? I mean, oh shoot, that's terrible. You know what I mean? Like, there's nobody on social media pushing harder to land Jerome Bettis Jr. than Deuce Knight. I mean, that, you know what I mean? So, and to your point about Denbrock, I mean, go again, go look at what th- this is what's frustrating, Sean, with, with some of the conversation is, is we have to be able to look at it and say, you, Mike Denbrock is not Dell Alexander or, or Chancey Stuckey. Mike Brown is not Dell Alexander or Chancey Stuckey. You don't you don't say, well, I don't trust this pickup because of what Chancey Stuckey did or did not do with these types of players or what Dell Alexander did or did not do with these types of players. Right. You evaluate them off what they they have done at their different stops. And when you look at what Mike Denbrock did as a recruiter and developer at Notre Dame of receivers, that was the last time Notre Dame really had any stretch of really good receiving receiver recruiting in multi in back to back. I mean, think about it. In in a three in a four year stretch, Mike Denbrock was the receivers coach for a team that landed Will Fuller, Corey Robinson, Corey um, Torrey Hunter Jr., Equinemy St. Brown, Miles Boykin, C.J. Sanders, Jalen Guyton, uh, Chase Claypool, Javon McKinley, and Kevin Stefferson. Like it's pretty flipping good, you know. And then what Mike Brown did with developing nothing but three stars into all drafted in the first three rounds of the draft with his receiving core Cincinnati, right? And so, and a guy that led them in receiving and catches and yards against Bama and George is the guy that Mike Denbrock initially recruited to Notre Dame and Michael Young, right? And so, and to your point, I mean, oh, you need the five stars like Jamar Chase. All right, cool. I'll see your Jamar Chase and I'll raise you a Justin Jefferson who didn't even rank in the top 2,000 coming out of high school. You know, and so it's like, look, what you need is talent. Stop assuming that talent is determined only by star rankings. You can give me the percentage of this, that, and the other thing. It's like, okay, there's going to be a higher percentage of four stars that, you know, five stars that get drafted than three stars. Yeah, because there's a thousand times more three stars and they're not good. There's a lot of good three stars. But still, and I pointed this out today, of the wide receivers in the 16 to 19 classes, Sean, 30, it's about 33% of the top 100 receivers from 16, 17, 18, 19 classes, 33% got drafted. That's it. Only eight of them, and it's 69 players, only eight of them got picked in the first round. That means 61 did not get picked in the first round. Only 16 of the 61 of 69, excuse me, got drafted in the first two rounds, and only 23 of the 69 got drafted at all. Now, the caveat is 10 of them are still in college, and some of them are going to be sixth year seniors next year. You don't have a lot of six years wide receivers getting drafted in the first two rounds. Let's be honest about that. Okay. So you're going to maybe a couple of those guys get drafted, but the number is still going to be in the 30s, 30%. Of the top 100 player, top receivers who were top 100 players in the 16 to 19 classes were drafted. Less than 50% of every class, the top 100 receivers got drafted. I'm not talking more first round picks, didn't get drafted, period. And the number of Justin Rosses that would have been drafted high, if not for injuries, is small. It doesn't move the needle or change the numbers a lot. So the point is the recruiting services miss plenty the fact is you need talent you need five-star players whether they're michael floyd five-star recruits or joe walt three-star recruits benjamin morrison three-star recruit and he was when he committed Notre Dame a three-star or christian gray top 100 don't care how you get it you need impact players who was Notre Dame's best defensive player last year sean i mean objectively 
Cam Hart. Okay. One of the best. You said offense? Did you say offense? Defense. Defense. Okay. Name me the top three players for name me the top two players for Notre Dame. Top three players on Notre Dame for defense last year. I think they're all David Watts, Cam Hart, and Benjamin Morrison. Yeah. Okay. Not one of them were ranked as top 300 players coming out of high school. Notre Dame had arguably the best secondary in college football last year. Now, if you're going to say who's the fourth, you're probably talking about Howard Cross. Nobody had him in the top 200. Rivals had him as a four star. Yeah, he wasn't ranked very high. Xavier Watson was a consensus three star. Benjamin Morrison was a four star, but eventually became a four. He was a three star when he got when he committed Notre Dame. Eventually yeah. drove rose up to four star. Nobody had him in the top three hundred. Nobody. Cam Hart was a three hundred. Uh, the three star play was ranked in the six hundreds. Yeah, right. And and so and Notre Dame had a elite defense last season. You could argue maybe it wasn't elite. It was outstanding. One of the five to eight best defenses in college football last year. And the, and they they had without a doubt a top two to three secondary, and their best players and and throughout the entire thing were three star players. They were five star. Xavier Watts is a five star college football player. Oh, absolutely. Benjamin Morrison is a five star college football. You need those. It, it I, but I don't care if they come to Notre Dame as five stars. The the difference is Sean. And here's another statistic: of the top hundred players that got drafted, I believe over half of them. Were yeah. top fifty recruits. So the top fifty guys hit it at an even higher rate, and here's why: those are the obvious ones. Right. Those are the ones you don't actually you don't have to have you any don't have really to be an evaluator to, to say to look at Jeremiah Smith and say he's really good. You don't. You don't have to be a great evaluator to look at Jamar Chase and say he's really good. You do have to be a good evaluator to look at Justin Jefferson and say he's really good. Right. And, and and that's the that's kind of the, the point that I'm getting to. I mean, look, Marvin Harrison Jr., you know, he's one of the generational player. And that's a debate for that's a conversation for another day. I don't think that he is because I think that term is used way too loosely. But Sean, only one recruiting service even had him in the top 80. 247 had him as the number 159 player. Only one recruiting service on three. And here's why I think on three is full of it, because this was a retroactive ranking. Mm-hmm. Just like they retroactively, you know, well, we're starting now, so we're going to rank last year's class that included Joe Alt and Marvin Harrison after they'd been freshman All-Americans, basically. And then, oh, yeah, we, we thought he was a good player. No, you didn't. Shut no, up. Didn't. You know, but but Marvin Harrison Jr. was was ranked by 247 Sports as the number 21 receiver in the country, number seven player in Pennsylvania, the number 159 overall player in the country. ESPN had an 82nd. Rivals had him 86th. Of the services that recruited him as a high school player, on three was the outlier because they didn't evaluate him till he was already in college. And then they said, no, 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 we're, we only evaluate. No, you didn't stop, stop. Because even if you try to do that, you can't, you can't, dis- you can't disassociate what you saw from him as a freshman at Ohio state onto that. Right. And so again, yeah. great player, not a very highly ranked recruit what, what right. And, and so to me, that's the thing that you got to look at and say, you need great players, however they come. And what Notre Dame is going to have to do and what they're doing, what they've done for a while. And by the way, ESPN had Malik Neighbors as a three-star. Rivals had him as a four-star, unranked player, number 50 receiver in the country. The highest ranking he had by a service that was actually doing it that time was 247 and had him ranked number 149 overall. He's about to be a top 10 NFL draft pick. So there's about two receivers are about to go in the top 10 in the NFL draft. And most of them were not considered e- like elite receivers, top hundred, top one fifty. Hmm. That's what they were, but they were not considered Julio Jones coming out of high school. They were not considered Jerry Judy coming out of high school, right? You need to find talent, and sometimes talent is obvious. Jeremiah Smith is obvious. I, my mother, my my grandmother. I mean, who who only watched football on Saturdays and Sundays could watch Jeremiah Smith and be like, that guy's pretty good. Yeah. Right. You don't have to be a paid evaluator to look at look at him and say he's pretty good. You don't have to be a paid evaluator to look at Trevor Lawrence and say he's pretty good. You got to be a pretty good evaluator to look at Joe Burrow and say he's pretty good coming out of high school. That's the difference. And, and also, so, go ahead. Who Sean. was it? Who was it? Uh, is that Home Depot? Like who? Who's the brand that says you got questions, we got answers? I, I think that's Home Depot. Is that Home Depot? That's Marcus Freeman. See, ladies and gentlemen, we stop. When Marcus Freeman got here, did he upgrade the talent? Did he honestly say there's a talent length athleticism problem in linebacker and immediately upgrade? Did he do that immediately? He recognized the talent discrepancy at the linebacker position and upgraded. 
Right. And we sit here and look at the linebacker room now for where it was before he got here as defensive coordinator, and we say, yo, we had questions. He has answers. Did he not? Look at the quarterback room yeah. at the end of a season and say, yo, we got questions, but you know what? We got right. answers. This is how I'm about to answer. Did he not look at other areas? Like, yo, right. Mike Mickens, defensive back room. Man, was a how many years did we worry about defensive back recruiting in Notre Dame? I'll and say, whether or not it could be. I'm 45. Lou Holt stopped coaching in 96. So basically from the minute Mike Mickens was hired mm -hmm. to the end of the Lou Holtz era is about yeah. how long I worried about secondary yeah. recruiting. Yeah. So they had we had questions. This staff had answers, right? Yeah. There's still some other areas, maybe you can say safety. But I mean that's definitely that one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But it's from a coaching standpoint and development, you just had a safety win the Bronco yeah. Nagurski award. Right. And right. you've had and you had you had a, an all American safety in 2021 uh -huh. and a first round draft pick at safety in back in 2011 after the 20. But here's the thing, Sean, too, is you 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 can address that's why they're focusing so much on the safety class in 2025. Mm -hmm. Here's the thing. What what I what I think we need to to, to be able to have here's the conversation we need to be allowed to have about the 2025 receiving class. Is it the right strategy? to focus on the high ceiling but maybe lower floor guys or should you be focusing on more higher floor guys that is a legitimate conversation to have with Notre Dame fans completely completely legitimate to look at Jerome Bettis Jr. and Elijah Burris and Derek Meadows and have that takeaway totally mm -hmm. valid what I pushed back on a little bit on the message board today and with some other people that I've talked to is they have this opinion that Notre Dame has just taken flyers or they're not willing to go after some top players. I'm like, you have to you have to look at this rationally. And and you're going to tell me that after landing Jaden Greathouse, Braylon James, Rico Flores, KK Smith in 2023, and then Cam Williams, Micah Gilbert and Logan Saldate in 2024, several of those were highly regarded players they had to battle top teams for that they just decided we don't want to do that anymore. We're just going to take low hanging fruit in 2025. That does, like just rationally, that doesn't make sense. Yeah. So my thing is, first before you start complaining about the offer lists or the or the rival the star rankings, which are fair conversations to have for people that aren't like talent evaluators. There, there's fans in our chat that I that that I respect a great deal because they'll tell you, I don't watch film. I I don't. I don't I don't know how to I don't know how to pull up film and evaluate Elijah Burris the way Notre Dame and, and and that's totally fair. So that's why I and they'll say that's why I look at star rankings and offer sheets. And those are very fair things to look at. Offer sheets are a good thing to look at. I've used Benjamin Morrison being, you know, beating Nick Saban and Jimmy Lake for him as evidence for what I like about him, right? So those are fair things to look at. But what we need to be able to do is to say this isn't about what you're saying it is which is low hanging fruit, you know, taking the easy road, taking flyers. It's not that. Right? It doesn't mean it's right, but it's not that. We need to be able to say, "Hey, their focus is on number 1, specific skill sets that they feel they need to add to the roster and they mm -hmm. feel these kids have them." And number 2, this is a staff that looks at the last 2 years and says, "We did a really good job landing some high floor guys. There's a lot of kids we like in this class." that maybe don't have the same floors, but we think have really high ceilings. Now there's some risk involved, but because of how well we did in the previous two classes and in the portal, we're willing to take this chance. So to me, it is to me, it's, it's, and, and like we even see it right now with Brandon, he says Notre Dame is known for uh, settling for easier recruitments instead of playing the process out uh, in the last 20 years. Again, Brian Kelly's not here anymore. So that's an irrelevant thing to say. Mike Den like uh Del Alexander's not here anymore. Right? Rob Ionello's not here anymore. Chancey Stuckey's not here anymore. This staff does not have that track record. The one thing oh, just two days ago everybody was praising Marcus Freeman for was their willingness to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with anybody for any recruit. So we're now to believe that they're not doing that at receiver just because. They don't want to, or maybe they see something that they think others are missing out on. They may be wrong. 
This isn't defending the staff's correctness just because I agree with it in this instance because I don't agree with it with Jerome Bettis Jr. And I don't necessarily agree with it with, Dor- with Derek Meadows, to be completely honest with you, because I have some concerns. Like, can he be a football player? Is he always just going to be a track guy with great tools but does not play football? You know, But there's a reason that Bama and Georgia and Florida and everybody's offered him since the summer camps, right? There's a reason for that because he's 6'6 and runs a 4'5". The point, however, is we can argue the strategy, right? We can argue the strategy, but there's too many people that obsess over, and and we're seeing in the chat, you have to get a a certain ranked player in every spot. That's not how recruiting is done. You know, so somebody pointed to to Joseph Reef and Dominic Hulak. Again, you're assuming that they settled. This staff loves Joseph Reef as a player. They don't care what his ranking is. They see a kid that they think is a very talented player. Dominic Hulak, Sean, is a niche player. They're recruiting for a certain role. They're not recruiting him to come in and play Mike Linebacker for four years. That's the thing is we if we're going to be critical of the, of the recruiting results, which is totally fair, you have to at least be willing to engage on a realistic evaluation of what their goals are. And you could say Dom, you know, Joseph Reef and Dom Hulak. Bama and Georgia and Ohio State sign guys like that every year. Every year. Because if every kid you recruit is a top 100 player, guess what? You're going to lose half your class every single year. Because when those top 100 kids aren't playing as rookies or near two, guess what they're going to do now? They're out. Got to build a roster, Sean. And that's the thing to have to – and sometimes your strategy from year to year is going to adjust based on your current needs – and what you've done in previous classes. Again, it doesn't mean that they're right. There are things about their receiver board right now that I don't agree with, but I can at least acknowledge I understand why they're doing it. There are things on the defensive side of the ball I don't necessarily agree. I personally would not have taken Dom Hulak. I wouldn't have. But I'm not criticizing them for it because there's nobody else on their board that plays the position they're recruiting him to play. You know what I mean? And so that's the thing you have to look at is if you're going to be critical of it, you at least need to be willing to, to Sean, you and I have political talks in our private life, right? Right. right. And the one thing that you and I have always said, the problem with why you can't have political conversation anymore is because people aren't even willing to accept the terms of the discussion. Because they're too busy trying to defend what they believe. Right. And that's kind of what's going on here is there's, there's people in the chat. I'm not talking about you, Brandon, that literally will not at all listen to any reason about Elijah Burris because of where he's ranked or what his offer list is. And that's the end of the conversation. It's like, that's just, we, we can't, we can't talk now. And that's my thing is we can be critical of it. And, and there are things I don't agree with of what they're doing. No staff is infallible. None. Mike Denbrock's not infallible. Marcus Freeman's not infallible. I'm not infallible. Sean's not infallible. Right. As far as I know, there's only been one infallible human being to walk this earth and he hadn't been around in a couple thousand years. No, you know what I'm hasn't. saying? So at least not bodily form. Um, but the, the point is, Sean, is we at least need to be able to have a conversation about the proper evaluation of what the strategy is and then being critical of that. That's where I think we're missing the boat a little bit in this receiver conversation in some in some areas. Right. As you you can. Be, if as long as you can accept the proper terms of the discussion, we can then agree to disagree or have a back and forth and that kind of thing. That's fair. You want to argue the merits of Elijah Burris as a player? That's fair. But you have to understand why they're going after him. And you can't say things like, well, this is easy or they're just settling. That's not it. Yeah, see, you can, not you, it. Can, you can argue the merits and the rankings, but make sure you acknowledge the film. See, that's the issue. If you want to use the rankings to say, uh, I don't know, you're not going to get that feeling if you watch the film. And for those of you that aren't able to watch the film, then you have to depend on those that are able to convey what the film is telling you about the young man and then weigh it. The point I was simply trying to make is that the talent on this roster is vastly different and improved. And if you have a head coach that has shown the willingness to admit where the weaknesses are at every position where the weaknesses are and do everything within his power to not only solve it, but to strengthen it to a level where they can win a national championship, which you have to let it play out to see if they can coach it to that point. 
but talent won't be the issue in 2024. That won't be the issue. You can't sit here and say this Notre Dame team is not talented enough to make the college football playoff. That's not true. You can't sit here and say they don't have enough five stars to get to the semifinals in the college football playoff. That's not true. Are their players going to make plays in the biggest moments, and are their coaches going to do the best job to get them to that level? That's what it comes down to. Plain and simple. Because the talent on the roster is vastly improved from what it was when Marcus Freeman took over. Hey, That's undeniable. Hey, Sean, I'm I'm old and I forget things. Who won the national championship this year? Uh, a team that had less talent, according to the recruiting rankings, than who, Notre Dame. Who was it? Um, Michigan. Michigan. Who was their leading receiver? Who was their best receiver this year? Well, it was uh, was it Roman Ro- Wilson? Roman Wilson. Yeah, who wasn't used that much, and he's in the senior bowl, like, ripping it up all last week. Well, Roman Wilson was ranked as the number 38, 54, and 76 wide receiver in the country coming out of high school. Right? I mean, again, you don't need – now, Ohio State, who had nothing but five stars running all over the field, Mm -hmm. Arvin Harrison Jr. is going to end his career with 0-3 against Michigan. Yeah. Emeka Buka may – may at best, Emeka is going to go 1-4, 1-3 against Ohio State. C.J. Stroud just won defense offensive rookie of the year last mm-hmm. year. What's his record against Ohio against Michigan? Zero and two. Yeah, you know what I mean. Like so, so you can give me all the five stars you want. Like I'm trying to build a team here. And you know the craziest thing, Brian? This is the craziest thing. Ohio State spent a lot of money to try and ensure their success. Guess what? Go look at the returning players for that Michigan defense and tell me how Ohio State's going to score. Yeah. Well, that's going to come up. <laughs> yeah, they returned the number one cornerback. They returned two safeties from a national championship secondary. They returned the two inside guys. There were beasts that are going to be possibly first two round picks. And they have linebackers that are better than the linebackers that are going to the NFL in the second round. Mm-hmm. Like Michigan isn't about to just wilt at Ohio State because they went and spent $15 million and got Chip Kelly as an OC and this guy and this defense. No, they're going to have to show up and beat Michigan. Right? They're going to, because Michigan is going to line up and punch you in the mouth, run the ball, and shut you down defensively. Yeah. And they're doing it with recruiting classes that are not top 10 recruiting classes. Right. I wonder why. They must have some pretty good talent of that talent. Well, evaluators. And that's the thing. They have ta- good talent evaluators and good talent developers. And, and that's the thing. Now, now this staff has to prove that they can develop it. And to a degree, they still have to prove that they can evaluate it. Mm-hmm. Because it and, and you know what, Sean, let's hold off on that till section three of the show. Let's, let's move to that. Let's wrap this section up and move to that. Cause that kind of ties into expectations for Notre Dame this year. Mm-hmm. in that conversation so that's a really good segue so why don't you go ahead and um uh, wrap up this section sean and then we'll we'll take it into the to the next one well, that's the end of the team segment right here on iris breakdown don't forget go to youtube like subscribe hit the notification bell and make sure you share and let everybody know for all the great recruiting intel and just great conversations between notre dame fans make sure you go sign up for boards the message board at boardsirisbreakdown.com as well now we're getting ready to go into the college football part of the show don't go away college football talk coming up right here irish breakdown podcast we're back irish breakdown podcast sean davis brian driscoll and this is the college football section of the program Uh, got a two-parter of the college football section Uh, we absolutely do so just to go and give you a little tidbit on what we're going to talk about we're going to talk about notre dame their returning production and how that plays. And then we're going to talk about some of the topsy-turvy things that have been happening in college football with head coaches of programs going to the NFL and, you know, coaches that went to Alabama returning back to the NFL. It's like some interesting situations. Chip Kelly leaving UCLA as the head coach to go be the OC at Ohio State. Why are all these things happening? Is it a trend or is it something that's just a one-off? or maybe two years and it'll go back to normal. We'll talk about that. But, Brian, we want to talk about returning production and the talent depth chart and how that might play out for Notre Dame 
and how they might forecast how good Notre Dame can really be in 2024. And we had a great article. Bill Conley has been doing this for like the last five years. Over The at- one at- thing he does well, in my opinion. <laughs> You don't like the SP plus? No, I think it's garbage because he'll have it's 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 projecting what will happen. I'm like, okay, but I just watched it happen. Mm-hmm. It's like at the end of the twenty was it twenty twenty one season or something like that. He had, he, or it's like twenty. Oh, what year was he? Had like he didn't have like LSU. I think finishing twenty nineteen number one. He had to go back and change it later. Had mm-hmm. like Ohio State and Clemson ranked higher. It's like he had Wisconsin ahead of Notre Dame like all year in 2021 after I just watched Notre Dame beat Clemson or Wisconsin by 28. You know what I mean? So it's just, it's a, I've said this sometimes the, the system is, when the system starts spitting out certain things, you've got to say, okay, we're, the formula is telling me this. It's time to change the formula. That's the reality of it. It's, it's time to change the formula. But this is one thing that he does that I rather enjoy. As long as it's taken in proper context and, and understood correctly and not as an end-all be-all, but I do think it's a very valuable conversation to have. And it's even harder to have it now, Sean, in the in the in the transfer portal era. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you compute how how do you compute production when you're including transfers and such? It's it's a very challenging thing. And Notre Dame is in a very unique situation, Sean, because we're gonna talk about where they're ranked. But the unique thing about Notre Dame is they're a little different than certain teams. It's kind of like Texas. You know, Texas this past year, if I remember correctly, didn't have super great production returning like Bama had, like Washington had, like Michigan had. But they were going into year three of Sark's tenure from a recruiting standpoint. And now his recruits were kind of taken over as the head of the program. Well, I and would that's why they were able to take that jump. Just to say this, uh, going into the 2023 season, uh, Texas sat 19th on the list, and they were 19th. How is that even possible? When they lost their top, that's I don't understand part of their stuff, Sean. Offensively, where were they? Were offensively? Offensively, they returned 85 percent. Defense. How is that even possible? They lost their entire running game. You're talking about going into 23. They they, he he includes the imports via the transfer portal. But who they get in the portal at running, like in the running game last year? They had all returners. They didn't give any new last year. No, they lost both of their running backs. Yeah. Right? They Who had a lot of their the production. Brooks, they, they bring in the Brooks kid. They but were Brooks bringing, was already part of the team. Right. They were bringing Quinn Ewers back. They were bringing A.B. Mitchell. Right. Who didn't have great – A.B. Mitchell didn't have much back. production. They were bringing the tight end back. Both of their tight ends came yeah. back. So that, I, I, just, I, it, I have to look at that, Sean, because that just – it doesn't make sense how that factors in. Like – I just don't understand it. We'll have to, we'll have that conversation for another day. But the fact of the matter is, Sean, is Notre Dame going into 2024 is not Mm going to rank super high when it comes to returning production. But, and, but it's because you got to look at two contexts. Number one is big picture nationally. Number two, though, is they have, it's really interesting, Sean, when you look at it compared to what their schedule is this season. And that's, that's the interesting part about it. So, when you look at your your what you had, it is very interesting because he has Notre Dame ranked seventy fourth in returning production with sixty percent. They have sixty one percent of their offense coming back, sixty percent of their defense, which makes a sense. Makes a lot of sense because they don't lose a lot of players on offense, but the guys they lost were very productive. You know, Audric Estime, Logan Diggs. I mean, not Logan Diggs, Sam Hartman, Chris Tyree, Tobias Merriweather. You know Rico Flores Jr. That's a lot of production, and then I'm also curious how they how they incorporate linemen into that. But Notre Dame obviously lost three starting offensive linemen as well. So, and then defensively they re- they lose their top two linebackers, they lose their most productive defensive linemen, and they lost Cam Hart, who production wise didn't have a lot of production, but was very very good on film. So Notre Dame ranks 64th, Sean. What's interesting is when you look at where they're their schedule ranks. And so uh, I was surprised with some of the stuff. And, and again, this is why I you read the article from Bill Conley and he talks about how the S and P rankings at the end of 2023, he had, he had Texas A&M ranked 16th in the S and P last year. Texas A&M was seven and six. How do you have them rank 16th at the end of the year? Like that's the thing that just I don't understand. But 
whatever. It is what it is. But he has Texas A&M ranked high. Where were they, Sean, in, in the um, the returning thing? They were they were high, correct? They were in 18th. You said Miami of Ohio was Notre Dame's next highest at, at number nine. Purdue ranks 96th. Northern Illinois ranks where was northern illinois at 57th 57th at 63 percent then you have louisville at 44th at 60 we play virginia correct mm, do we play virginia this later year? uh later in the year they do yeah okay. i was i was going kind of in order of of the okay. schedule yeah. stanford's 37th mm -hmm. uh which is uh pretty good for them i'm actually pulling up the they the return schedule. a lot on offense who does not, Stanford? Not yes. so much defensively. Yeah. Well, in like a, an offense, like they they part of the thing that hurt them in 2023 was they had a lot of injuries. But so like they lost Benjamin Urasek. So when you think about them losing Benjamin Urasek to Georgia, Georgia right? that doesn't hurt them from a returning production standpoint because he didn't play mm -hmm. part, uh, most of the year. Uh, but they have a lot coming back. Georgia Tech uh, ranks. Where's where's he got Georgia Tech? Georgia Tech is 48 at 68%. Okay, they go Jaw Tech. Okay, so that's why I couldn't find that. So they're 46. They return a lot. Theirs is really fascinating because they get they rank seventh in offensive returning production at 83%. 83%. Yeah. But they rank 105th in defensive pro, yeah. uh, pro, uh, projected return re, what returns on on defense. Then next for Notre Dame on their schedule after Georgia Tech is Navy. And Navy ranks 34. 34. Yeah. Florida State ranks 83rd. So the team that you're most concerned about, at least I'm most concerned about on the schedule, ranks 83rd. And then Virginia, you said they rank very high. Fifth. Virginia's fifth. They return yeah. a lot, and that includes transfer. So one of the things that Notre Dame loses is going to Virginia, obviously. Right. And then rounding out the schedule, too, they play USC at the end. And USC ranks 31st. Again, I got I just have to figure out how these things work. So USC ranks no, USC was ranks 99th. 31st. Oh, I'm looking at the S P plus. Sorry. Okay. Sorry. I was yeah, I was having USC ranks 99th. 99th. They, they rank 96th on offense and 102nd on defense. Yeah. So they're very low. Alabama ranks 115th. Michigan ranks 128th. Washington ranks 130th. Yeah. So when you look at the teams that, you know, played for the title this year, some big drop-offs for the title. Texas at 25th is the only one that returns a good amount. They rank 25th. Some other notables, Oregon ranks 28th. Ohio State ranks 70th. That's another one that I found interesting when you look at, like, the, the transfer class. But, you know, that's a team – that people think are going to be really good. And so when you like look at the preseason top five, Sean, mm -hmm. what's really fascinating is a lot of the consensus top five teams, it's like obviously Ohio State, Georgia, you know, so Georgia this year ranks what are they're they're near they're up there pretty high. They're 47th. Uh they're they're a team that people think Ohio State's a team that's in there. They're 70th. Uh Ole Miss is another team that's a, a very high ranked preseason top five team. They're 68th. Uh Texas is 25th. And then Penn State is a team that's getting a lot of love. They're 23rd, so they're up there very high. But a lot of the teams that people considered the top title contenders this year are teams that are in a similar boat to Notre Dame, which is kind of part of that context. But you had last year's, right, Sean? You had last year's rankings. Mm -hmm. Can you tell us what the four playoff teams were, then where Georgia was, where Florida State was, and where Oregon was? Because those are the top seven teams this year. Where were those four teams ranking in, in 2023? So Florida, oh, I'm sorry. This is just a notable. Florida State was number one coming into the season at 87%. So that kind of Because they had almost there. everybody coming back. Plus yeah. they landed like Keon Coleman and Fentrell Cypress and yeah. Braden Fisk and guys like that. Yeah, that, that, yeah. that tracks. Uh, Texas was 19th at 74%. Washington was 22nd at 73%. Uh, Michigan was right there at 72%. And then Alabama was the outlier. They were in the 70s, if I'm not mistaken. You looking for Alabama? Yeah. 
Alabama in 2003, coming into the 2023 season. Gotcha. Yeah, because they lost. I mean, they lost some pretty good players. I thought they. I thought they ranked high, though. I thought you, or at least I thought you said that they did. Um, I mean, let's see here. Twenty twenty three, Alabama. No, Alabama was one hundred and twenty fifth, returning forty okay. percent. South Alabama was thirteenth. Yeah, there you they go. were one hundred twenty fifth. They were really low. So that just shows you the nuance. Of- Georgia was eightieth. Yeah, this year. So Georgia was eightieth, and they were pretty good this year. And then Oregon ranked 54th. They were very good this year as well. So there were, there were some teams this season, Sean, that were pretty good, I would say, that didn't rank as high. So the, the point in Notre Dame ranked 44th, by the way. They were at 65% on offense, and they were 72% on defense. So when you look, LSU was 32nd. This year, Ole Miss was 30th. A couple other just notables. Wisconsin was 27th, but they took a big step back uh, in some areas this year. Uh, Boston College was 8th, which explains why BC went from a pretty bad team in 2023 or 2022 to a bull team in 2023. I mean, that and very right, competitive. You, right, yeah. right. So those things factor into it. So, I mean, you look at these and then Syracuse was 10th. They didn't take a step forward. Rutgers was 8th. They did take a step forward. Virginia was 5th. Again, last or you know, this is this is that's 24. Sorry. Michigan was fifth in 2023, right? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, Kansas was second. It was pretty good. Yukon was sixth, and they were much worse this year than they were the year before. Texas AM was seventh, and they were not very good this year. Missouri was ninth. They saw a jump. So the point is USC was 14th. They took a big step back. Yeah. Utah was 16th. They took a big step back. So the, the point is, is like, I think this is a valuable conversation to have as long as we can avoid the this is that. So it equals this outcome. Right. Because it is a fascinating conversation that that because, I mean, you and I were talking this off. No, you, I think, disagreed with me. But I thought this was the year that Alabama finally took the big step back. Because of a lot of what they lost. And. They went to the playoff again. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like yeah. they won the SEC. They weren't as sexy winning the SEC as they were. But I, I was, I was, Sean. When I looked at it, I was actually a little bit surprised that Notre Dame ranked as low as they did. Just gut feeling wise, it, because well, let me let me rephrase. I wasn't surprised at where they ranked because I was anticipating all the guys that they lost and not counting the portal guys. When you count the portal guys, I was actually very surprised that Notre Dame ranked where they ranked in returning production because of how much we I broke this down last week, man, they're, they have over 3000 yards returning at receiver next, just receiver next year. That doesn't include, and the running backs that they have coming back. Yeah. They lost 1300 yards from Audric. They have over a thousand yards of total offense coming back and running back too. And so it, it has to be like really heavily quarterback driven somehow because obviously there you don't have a lot coming back. I wonder if that or and how does O line factor into it? So there's a lot of things, Sean, that I, I think are kind of interesting when um, when 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 you look at it. But the facts are Notre Dame ranks um, lower, and a lot of their opponents rank higher in returning production this year, which makes a very interesting conversation, Sean, when you think about what came back, what comes back, and what doesn't. I'm actually going to also try to find the 2022 the, stuff too. The, uh, the nuance of the situation is the transfers that are coming in directly go to what we were talking about in recruiting. Like, can you be honest in your evaluation, not only in recruiting, but evaluation of your own team? You're not just evaluating recruits, you're evaluating what needs to be changed in your own team. And one of the evaluations at the wide receiver position regardless of recruiting is we cannot allow what took place in the wide receiver room with not having versatility to be able to have players that fit certain positions in case of injury. Mm -hmm. We must have more versatility and depth with skill set in the wide receiver room. Mm -hmm. So that might dictate, let's go after these certain kids in this class. Or if we don't feel the 25 class is as strong, Maybe we'll go after the top kids in the 26 class right. because 
we view the top kids Ooh. in the 25 class as guys that we really don't have a shot at or right. you know we can find a player that has similar traits and skill sets and we can get we know we can get him into the class yeah rather than taking the chance that if we try to re recruit this kid into the fall he might not come in Notre Dame. Yeah. Those are questions you have to ask yourself as a staff. It's not just as simple as, oh, we like this guy and we like this guy, so we're going to go recruit. This is, you know, this is you being honest about your program, what's needed, and how you're going to choose to answer that question. Brian, it wasn't the right thing to do. And this is, look, this wasn't the right thing to do. When I was a kid, that when I needed a screw, unscrewed the butter knife worked just as good as the flathead it wasn't the smartest thing to do All right but got dosh garnet and yeah. when i needed to put a toy, toy together hey let me go get this butter knife out to the out of the kitchen it mm -hmm. worked mm -hmm. wasn't the smartest thing i just didn't know where the flat but my father put the flatheads right i would have used it if i could have found it mm -hmm. but i couldn't so you know i went to the next best thing to get the job done and yeah. it just happened to be the butter knife so I mean, yo, you, yeah. you find what you need. Yeah. Real quick before we continue, Sean, just do me a real quick favor. Check your text message real quick. Um, here's the other part of this too, Sean. And this is where the Notre Dame dynamic is a little bit different than some of the other teams that we're looking at. Because you and I were talking about this, Sean. And I here's the funny part. And this is why we did start doing the RTCF show is because, and Sean said it perfectly, we were talking about how we need to take the conversations we're having on the phone and make them into shows. The problem is sometimes, Sean, because we do shows together, I don't remember if we talked about this on the phone or if we talked about this in a previous show. So I'm just going to say it anyway. But Notre Dame's entering into a period where they're losing a lot of veterans. You're losing Joe Walt. You're losing Blake Fisher, Zeke Carell, Sam Hartman, Audric Estime. A lot of those different guys, J.D. Bertrand, Maris Leofau, Javante Jean-Baptiste, Nana Safamenta, Cam Hart, D.J. Brown, Ramon, you know, a lot of good football players. Some of them aren't that great, but a lot of good football players there. You know, D.J. Brown's a guy that, that that caught a lot of flack from us in the past, and he had a really solid year this year for Notre Dame. He, he's productive. But what we're, what we're at, however, is in past years, I honestly would be a lot more concerned about where this team was going to be because of the loss production. Here's why two things are different now than was different than when Brian Kelly was the head coach. Number one, the transfer portal. It's there, there are uh, talent acquisition avenues available to Marcus Freeman that weren't necessarily available to Brian Kelly to a degree. Now, a lot of what Notre Dame gets is the, is, is grad transfers and Notre Dame could always do that. And they did. I mean, you think back to, uh, getting uh, Riggs, Cody Riggs, back in, in 2014, which when Kavari got suspended, ended up being huge for Notre Dame. You know, Lohi Gilman was a, a transfer. I mean, so they, they got some transfers, but it's just such a more common thing now. Guys like Riley Leonard didn't jump into the transfer portal four years ago because he would have had to sit out. Bo Collins would have – Chris Mitchell's they would have got. So you, you get the point that I'm making. So the transfer portal's there. But here's the other situation. In the past, you know, in 2017, 2018, when 2016, then they lost a lot. That was part of the reason I was concerned because I didn't think the foundation in the program was great. And I thought the program was going to take a step back because I didn't think they had recruited well enough at certain spots and they weren't coached well enough on one side of the ball to where they could just lose all the guys they lost and still be good. And they weren't. Here's what's different now. Unlike 2016 when they lost a lot of production they didn't have the portal to replace it and they didn't have a healthy foundation and they were in year what seven of brian kelly's tenure right now we're in a situation where when you go into year three you have the portal to help replace some of the production but number two this is when we truly find out who marcus freeman and the staff are as evaluators and developers because so much of the roster is going to be filled with guys that were recruited by or primarily coached by this staff. You think about the quarterback position, pure portal. The entire running back depth chart was, was acquired by this staff or in one, one exception, 
and that's J- Jadarian Price, who was recruited by the previous staff, but was only coached by this staff, right? The receiving core is almost Jaden Thomas, Deion Colsey is it when it comes to guys that were coached and recruited by the previous staff. Tight end, you have one kid that was basically that's going to be a regular that was recruited and coached by the previous staff, and that is Mitchell Evans, who caught one pass under that previous staff, right? His situation a little bit different. That's a new position coach. That's one where it's different. Offensive line, Charles Jagasaw, Billy Shrouth, uh, Ashton Craig, Pat Coogan have only been coached by Harry Heastand or Joe Rudolph, right? And a lot were recruited by this current staff, Marcus Freeman's staff, or they were only coached by Marcus Freeman. So like Billy Shrout, that class was recruited by, recruited when Brian Kelly was still the head coach, right? And you know, Ashton Craig was recruited by Brian Kelly's, that staff, but only have played for Marcus Freeman and his staff. And so there's a little less of that on defense at certain spots. The D-line has a lot of guys that were recruited and coached by Mike Elston. And, but also you think about that, but the last year, Brian Kelly, they were coached by Marcus Freeman. So, but even the, even on defense, Sean, you've got Jalen Sneed, Drake Bowen, Jay Nosbury, Kingston Villiam Asa, you've got Christian Gray, Jaden Mickey, guys that are stepping into much more prominent roles that are that are Marcus Freeman only players. They he recruited them, he evaluated them, and I mean he he and his staff. And now they're responsible for developing them. And the point I made in the show this past week, Sean, was you can no longer credit Brian Kelly for any success Notre Dame has from here on out, but you can also no longer blame Brian Kelly if you don't reach your objectives from here on out. 2022 and 23, you could point to certain positions that weren't recruited very well by the previous staff, receiver being one. The fact that you had to rely on so many young players in 2023 was because of failures of the previous staff. Can't blame that anymore. Can't blame them on that anymore. You're in year three. You got portal guys. Jaden Thomas is a senior. Deion Colsey is a senior. Jaden and Jordan Faison both had very good freshman production. You got an elite five-star kid coming in. You've got a six-foot, two, 210-pound kid coming in to play. You got really good tight ends. No excuses this year. And so the success is going to be – and this is why I think it actually trumps the, the production lost more than it would in past years because it is still now the Marcus Freeman culture is going to be felt. That doesn't mean it's going to be good. I'm not saying it's going to be bad. We don't know. But that's why I say this is where we're going to truly find out what kind of coach, but even more so for this conversation, what kind of recruiter that Marcus Freeman and his staff are. Are the players that, that they landed that maybe weren't as highly ranked that we really like as good as we think they are? or not, you know, are, are, are they the developers that we think that they are across the board or not? We know Al Golden can take veteran players that were already in college for three, four years. And in their fifth and sixth years, turn them into really good players. Can he take kids that were puppies when he got them and turn them into really good players? We don't know the answer to that yet. Think about it. The only coach that's had in the last two years, the only coach at Notre Dame on defense that has had to take raw, young players that have never been coached before and turn them into dudes is Mike Mickens. That's it. That's it. You could say Chris O'Leary to a degree because he got he got Xavier Watts from receiver late in the process. So you maybe give him a little bit of credit. But everybody else was a vet the last two years. So those are the things we're going to find out, Sean, and that's why I say even though I'm excited about the season, that's the one thing in the back of my mind that says, well, there's still a lot to prove. But it's also the thing that if we're right about Marcus Freeman and his ability and this staff, then they're going to way outplay the production that was lost. And the other factor is that number on offense looks a lot different if Riley Leonard's 2022 production was taken into account because of because of the injury. That's the other part of it, too. So th- it's going to be fascinating. I know that's a long tangent, Sean, but it's going to be fascinating. And that's why I think this part of the conversation for Notre Dame when you talk about loss production is going to be a little bit of an asterisk compared to other teams. And, and, and Texas was the it was an example because, again, year three, they had a lot coming back, 
but a lot of what they had coming back was Sark's guys. Right. It was his. It was guys that either he recruited, right, and developed, or he may not have recruited them, but he's the only one that developed them. And you saw them go from five and seven, eight and five, college football playoff, right. And the foundation in their name is better because he because because Coach Freeman inherited a better program than Sark inherited at Texas. Can he have that similar year three drum? Now that it's his dudes, we're gonna find out, man. And that's partly what gets me excited because I do have belief that he is what we think he is. Yeah. And then, you know, to just sum it all up, what you're talking about from recruiting, evaluation, recruiting, coaching, and development to manifestation on the field, you know, all of that comes about because everyone's pulling on the same rope and there's a buy-in, right? And you're entering into a no-excuse era for Marcus Freeman, right? Okay. It was inexcusable year one, losing to Marshall at home, but okay, I get it. Right. The next step is, yo, you cannot have close games with teams that you are obviously better than, especially at home. You can't be struggling against Mac teams. OK. Notre Dame, from a points per game standpoint, the offense took a step forward. And also they demolished teams that they were better than. They didn't, they didn't have those close games that they were having the previous two years. Another step forward. Now, what's the necessary step this year? The necessary step is going to be, once again, the big games. Okay. You only you don't have, I think, the high-level big games that you had in 2023 on the schedule, but Louisville. What are you going to do in Louisville, which is a revenge game, right? USC at the end of the year, which probably is going to be pivotal into you getting into the playoffs or securing a spot that you might already have in the playoffs. Maybe you secure a fifth seed instead of being an eighth seed or a ninth seed. Things like that. So they're going to be two at Florida State. We don't know. They don't return a lot. But we don't know who they're going to be in November. You know, that could be a big game. And all of this comes down to the point that, yo, it's going to be very important that their evaluation and their recruiting to the style of team that they want to be. Because that Michigan, forgive rankings, but Michigan did a great job recruiting to the style of team they want it to be. And they were willing to take their lumps for three consecutive years in the playoffs because they were committed to saying, this is how we're going to win. And as much as you, as you might disagree with Marcus Freeman, he believes that this is the way we're going to win at Notre Dame. And he's been very, man, avid about it. We're going to run the ball, stop the run, and try to be explosive in the passing game. We'll see how that evolves with Mike Denbrock and Mike yeah. Brown, but that's what they're recruiting oh. to yeah. on all levels. And, and they're not settling and hiring to and hiring to as Absolutely. well, Sean, it's yeah. like you, you, it, it, we, we go back to, okay. You can't bring, blame Brian Kelly anymore because you don't have Brian Kelly staff anymore. I mean, the only, the only position coaches that I can think of that were on staff when Brian Kelly was here, the first go round, or you know, like from for the the last go round, I should say, is what Chris O'Leary and Mike Mickens. Mike Mickens was going to get hired by by Marcus Freeman, whether he was at Notre Dame before he got here or not. Right, he was a Marcus Freeman guy, even though Brian Kelly hired him. And then Chris O'Leary, who Marcus Freeman had the primary say on promoting him from analyst to, to position coach when Marcus Freeman was the defensive coordinator. So it's very much it, – there's nobody left on offense that I can think of that was a Brian Kelly hire. Nobody. Now, Mike Denbrock was a Brian Kelly hire the last time, but he has worked with with Marcus Freeman since then. So, again, they have that relationship. They were spent, what, four years together at Cincinnati. So it's a little bit of a different deal. You know, the entire offensive staff, you you know, you can't look at and say, well, you know, the Tommy Reese hired that guy, and he, he wasn't any good. And Tom Reese is a Marcus Freeman wasn't a Marcus Freeman guy. You can't use that excuse anymore, because the look Tom Reese is the OC when they hired Dylan McCullough. Are we going to say that that was a bad hire? No, you know what I mean. Like it, it, you can't use that excuse anymore, and that's partly Sean like getting why I'm so excited because yes, they're going to be inexperienced at certain spots, but in the past, the inexperienced guy stepping into the lineup was a Drew White type of guy, and I love Drew White, but now it's Drake Bowen or Jaden Osbury, or Jalen Sneed, or Josh Burnham. You know, it was like you had to, you lost your starting big end, and so you had to move 
Michael, you know, Myron Tungvaloa Mosa out there where he wasn't supposed to play. Now it's like, hey, Josh Burnham, we're moving you over there. You know, and, and you lose a Cam Hart in the past. Notre Dame would lose a guy like Cam Hart, and you're like, this is going to be interesting. You'll know, see how this pans out. You know, you lost you lost uh, Julian Love and in, 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 in 2018, and then you lost Troy Pride the next year. And you're trying to replace them in 2020 with Clarence Lewis and Nick McLeod and Tariq Bracey. Now you lose Cam Hart, and you're replacing with Christian Gray and, and Jaden Mickey and Micah Bell and Leonard Moore. And it's just such a different animal now, Sean, when you look at it and say – the quality of, of of recruit that we believe is now in the program is so much better than in the past where it was like, you better hope that guy pans out because that – I don't know about that that pick pickup. Or the depth chart was so thin that like in 2022, if Lorenzo Styles doesn't take that big jump in 2022, your receiving core is pretty much screwed. There's not that pressure on Jaden Greathouse in 2024. If Jane Greathouse has a breakout season and becomes that dude, great. But if he doesn't, you're okay. It's not going to hurt you as much as it hurt them when Lorenzo Styles didn't make that kind of jump in 2022. That's that's the point, right? And so, to me, if he, if the young buck has that breakout, it just makes you that much better. But there's not that pressure on Jaden to go out there and be that dude as a true sophomore, or we're in trouble, as there was before. And, and that's the thing that you look at and you start getting kind of fired up by. I mean, you know, a couple of years ago, Notre Dame had to go to the portal and get Kane Madden to try to solidify the offense because they were in a rough spot. Now it's like, yeah, you don't know who's going to be the starting guard and center or, you know, I mean, they're, they're, they're young guys, but it's it's an elite talent like Charles Jagasol. It's an elite talent like Billy Shrouth. It's a really good high upside. I think I gave Ashton Craig a four and a half star upside grade coming out of high school. Loved his potential. He just had to fill out and learn to play the game and all that stuff. But the talent is going to be so much better next year, in my opinion, top to bottom. But then we circle back to the previous conversation. How much, however, will the lack of production or production together impact this team or not? Will it be a hindrance when it comes to Because you could say, well, they're bringing back 3,000 yards of receiving, but – well over half of that, almost two thirds of that, is production that was met, done, provided for outside of a Notre Dame uniform, not in a Notre Dame uniform. Right, that's the question mark. It's not just about numbers, but it, can you translate that? Like when Will Fuller came out after 2014, you knew he could be great in 2015 because you saw him do it in a Notre Dame uniform in that offense. It was it was an easy one, right? It'd be different if Will Fuller would have done that at like Georgia Tech. And now he's transferred to Notre Dame, and you're thinking, you're hoping that it can pan out. You're hoping that he can do what he did at Notre Dame, do at Notre Dame what he did at Georgia Tech or Penn State or where he was originally committed, but there still was an unknown. I think Bo Collins could be really good at Notre Dame, but I got to see it. I think he made the wrong choice out of high school, and he went to a place that didn't fit his skill set. And now at Notre Dame, that fits his skill set better, especially now with Mike Denbrock, I think he could be a breakout player. That is 100% pure projection. Because I've seen both Collins take zero snaps in a Notre Dame uniform. I think Riley Leonard could be one of the five best quarterbacks in college football next year. 100% projection. Because I don't know that he can repeat 2022 Duke at Notre Dame. I don't know. It's a whole different pressure game, man. I don't know. And so that's where the, the questions come. But here's why I'm fired up, Sean. There's a lot of questions. But at the end of the day... I believe that Marcus Freeman, the one thing he has shown, he, in my opinion, is elite at, is town acquisition. We're going to find out if I'm correct. If you and I, because I think we're on the same page there, Sean, this is the year we start to find out if we're correct in that. Or is the develop one of two things. They're not as good as town of as we thought. Or B, they're not good enough developers to take advantage. We're going to find out whether that's true or both are good. And this team's going to be really, really good. That's the question mark because of the lack of production. You can't ignore that. You can't, you can't ignore the fact that in 2023, all the playoff teams, except for, well, three of the four playoff teams were teams that had really good production coming back. 
right? You you can't ignore the fact that in 2022, TCU, who made the playoff that year, ranked ninth in returning production. Can't ignore that. You can't. But, you know, you also can't ignore the fact that Georgia won a title that year in 2022, despite ranking 96th in returning production <laughs> that year, right? When we talk about Notre Dame, you know, one of the things that hurt them, Notre Dame had to re- fill a lot of new shoes in 2022. They ranked higher than Georgia did in returning production, not by a lot, but they did, you know. And so, you know, Michigan this past year, last, past two years, ranked really high. Michigan in six, in 2022, when they made the playoff for the second time, only had 60, they ranked 67th in returning production. They only brought up 43% of their defense came back in 2022. That's it, right? So there have been years where the t- best teams in the country ranked lower in that. But why was Michigan and, and, and Georgia able to overcome personnel losses? Because they had recruited to their system, like you're explaining, and they were very good evaluators and developers. So they were just plugging and playing, baby. Is Notre Dame that type of team? That's the big question mark, right? That's the million dollar question. But I'm bet, but I truly believe the talent level is going to be significantly better this year. The experience and the development are the questions. And we're going to find out let's, those. Let's be honest. It's so nuanced and winning is so the margin is so slim, right? Michigan, someone in the chat said Michigan just got there this year. Michigan's been in the college football playoff three consecutive years. They were literally inches away from getting to the college football playoff in Jim Harbaugh's first season. Like, so this style was tried and true. He had some tough times where he had to trust it and not go away from it. But eventually they got to the point where they kept knocking on the door, knocking on the door. And eventually, what was the nuance of it? They had to let their young quarterback get to the point where he can make big plays and big moments. He made enough. He wasn't that great. I don't think he's a first round pick. Like these evaluators are putting him in the first round of the NFL draft. But he made an, he made a big play against Alabama late. He made a couple of throws for some key touchdowns early in that game. Washington, he made in the fourth quarter, he made a clutch throw to extend the lead and get Michigan started on pulling away from Washington in that game. He made enough plays when he had to make them. And that was the nuance because they felt like we can't win it with Cade McNamara. This kid is going to have to be the one that gets us over the top in our style of play. Right. Who's going to be that quarterback for Notre Dame? Is it going to be Riley Leonard? Is it going to be Kenny Minch? Is it going to be Steve Angeli? Is it eventually going to be CJ Carr or Deuce Knight? But that's what they're banking on. In the style of play that we're we're recruiting to, we're going to need our quarterback. Riley Leonard doesn't have to be Superman like he was at Duke, but he's going to have to make some big plays. He's going to have to make some big time throws and clutch moments. If Notre Dame is going to get to where they want to be, and ultimately, that's what we're talking about with recruiting to your style of play into your system and then trusting the system. Because like anything in life, Brian, you're going to be tested. Marcus Freeman and his belief and his system, they, it's been tested. Last year, it was tested tremendously on the road, right? Like it doesn't make sense that we are who I think we can be at home. Even in a home loss to Ohio State, I've come away feeling like that's who we are. We can compete with the top teams. Now we go on the road and all of a sudden we're a totally different team. Like what? The execution drops off. What's wrong? That's your system being tested. That's your culture also. That's your culture being tested. And you have to stick to your guns even in the midst of that storm and say, yo, this is who we are. And this is how we're going to eventually hoist this trophy. Because to your point, Sean, this is such a great point. They didn't lose to Ohio State and at at Louisville and at Clemson because the culture is flawed. Meaning, let me rephrase, because what Marcus Freeman wants the culture to be is flawed. They lost because they didn't live up to the standard and to the culture. That's the difference right? Michigan did not win it all in 2021 because they played a better team. They didn't win it all in 2022 because when they got on the big stage, they went away from what got them there and they got beat, right? Turning the ball over, undisciplined, 
not really sticking to what got you there, all those type of things, giving up big plays. They didn't live up to the culture. They didn't live up to the standard. In 2023, with what I would argue was a less talented team, but a more bought-in team, a team that said, I don't care what the moment is. I don't care what the situation is. We are going to be who we are no matter what. So they come out, they, they're playing poorly against Alabama, and it looked just like the TCU game the year before. Turning it over, giving them points. But what the difference was, this year's Michigan team said, we're, we're fine. Calm down. Let's go do what we do. And unlike 2022 against TCU, the mistakes early didn't keep piling up. They didn't snowball like they did in 2022. They stuck to their guns. And that's the thing for Marcus Freeman is you have a culture that you want. Can you get this team to live up to that standard and play within that culture week after week after week after week? That's the question. You say, well, you know, Notre Dame's schedule is harder. Fair. But I watched Ohio, I watched Michigan go on the road against a top 10 Penn State team and not throw the ball one single time in the second half of that game and kick Penn State's butt physically. Because it wasn't about play calling. It was, I mean, it was about we are going to be who we are. We're going to beat you up. You're going to be the one that makes the mistakes, and we're going to go beat you. That's the difference. Can Marcus Freeman get this program to that point? That's the big question because as we go back to it, I truly believe that the town is there. But we're going to find out if we're right about that this season, Sean. That's the point. Because your first class, the Jalen Sneeds, the Josh Burnhams, the Benjamin Morrisons, the Jaden Mickeys, they're juniors now. You're, you got three full classes that are nothing, juniors, sophomores, and freshmen that are nothing but your dudes. You either recruited all of them or at the very least you coached all of them. Because there were some kids that committed in the 2022 class that were committed before Marcus Freeman was the head coach. But all the defensive guys that were committed, committed to him as the defensive coordinator. Offensively, it's a little bit of a different deal. But you're not going to have a lot of 2022 guys in the lineup on the offensive side of the ball. You know what I mean? So it's like it's going to be a lot of the 23 and the 24 and, and, and guys like in transfers. So we're going to find that if the talent acquisition is there. But the other part of it is now no more blaming Brian Kelly's flawed culture for where you are as a program. You could you could kind of use that as an excuse in year one and for sure in year one. And you brought up the Marshall game. I think the Stanford game was worse. I think at least Marshall was a good team. You have no excuse losing to them. But they were 9-10 win team. Stanford was terrible. Like in a calendar year before they beat Notre Dame, the only team that Stanford had beaten was Colgate. Like that is a culture. That's not a talent problem. That's a culture problem. That's a you don't have the right mindset, the right toughness, physically or mentally, to get the job done. You could blame that somewhat on Brian Kelly, and you and I have harped on that for years. You can't use that excuse anymore. You're in year three, man, and that's the article I wrote a couple weeks ago, Sean. Year three is that no more blaming anybody else for where who you are. It's now about you. Lou Holtz spent the first two years at Notre Dame in 1986 and 1987 figuring out what the problems were within that program talent-wise and culture-wise, and he fixed both of them and won a title in 1988 with a roster that had a good number of his guys, but also still a bunch of guys that were recruited by the previous staff. It was that nice mix, but here's the difference. Whether it was Faust guys or his guys, they were all bought into the same culture or they were gone. They weren't going to play. And that's a question I have for Marcus Freeman is, do you have, do you and your staff have the stones, for lack of a better term, to take guys that aren't bought in but may know the defense better or the offense better and say, I don't care. Go sit because I'm going to play this young guy that's bought in. I hope we don't have to have that circumstance. But that's sometimes what you need to be willing to do in order to show everyone this is more important than this. Buy-in is more important than your 40 time, right? Buy-in is more important than your length. Buy-in is more important than your agility and your three-cone drill. Buy-in has to be number one, and then after that, everything else comes. And that's what we're going to find out. Because, again, it's your roster. It's your team. It's your players. No more excuses. But I'm fired up about it, man. 
because I do think I do think the town is there. I think this is going to be Notre Dame's most athletically gifted team and deepest team in a long time. And we've been talking about this team being deep for a couple years now. Mm-hmm. And in 2023, it, but it, it was pretty deep in 2020, which is why you could have all the injuries they had on offense and skill, still score 39 points a game. Because you you were still putting, I mean, yeah, you lost Jaden Thomas and Deion Colt, but you still were throwing Jaden Greathouse out there, even though you messed up, shouldn't have been playing. He's still a pretty good football player. And you're still putting good, yeah, you you lost Zeke Carell, and, but you're still putting Ashton Craig and Billy Shrouth out there. You know, Joe Walt decides not to play the bowl game. You still replace him with, with Charles Jagasol. You know what I mean? And and I think that's where that's what's going to be a separator for me. And Antoine was talking about earlier, Sean, if you're truly going to make a run, you can't just be good in your front in your first 11. You got to be 18, 19, 20 deep on both sides of the ball if guys can help you if you're going to make that kind of run. And that's where the town acquisition comes from, but also where the mental and physical toughness comes from. There's no doubt. There's no doubt. I, I totally agree. And I think the biggest thing that we can take from this is that Notre Dame is in a place where success should show up. That's the excitement right now. The success should show up based upon everything you just said. With the roster being in his third year, everybody is pretty much his guys that he either coached, evaluated, recruited, or has been with them more than they were with any other coach or any other staff. Okay, now is the time. And your culture has been through the fire. It's been through the fire. So the next step is, yo, yes, you need to see Notre Dame. First game of the year, hostile environment against a pretty good coaching staff and a pretty good team. Show up. Culture, right out right out the bat. Test of the culture and the steps you've taken forward. And we'll see whether or not they pass the pass the litmus test. It's, it's as simple as that. There is no hiding from the importance of game one in 2024. It's going to tell you a lot and it's going to mean a lot. Doesn't mean that if it goes the wrong way that they can't recover and it can't be a great season and they can't make it to the college football playoff, but it's going to tell you a lot. That first game is going to tell you a lot. So, I man, I love, you know, being able to talk about just sports in general, man. There's so many different paths to winning, right? And, yeah, you can say Michigan, that yeah, they haven't – they've struggled for 20 years. Heck, it's been since 1988. I don't care if, it, if it's a one, one-off. Yeah. I'll take it. I'll take that one great year right now. Somebody asked, like, would you if if would you be willing to have Marcus Freeman and the entire staff basically leave like Michigan did if it meant you won a title? And I was like, I wouldn't even think twice about that. Of course, no, you're not thinking twice of about course. that. Of course, I don't think that's going to be the case because that's a different circumstance. But yeah, it's going to be fun, Sean. So uh, let's just wrap up this section real quick, folks. Hit that like button, hit the subscribe button, hit the notification bell, share this podcast, leave us a five star review. We'd greatly appreciate that, of course. And if you have not done so already, as you see that down there below, for those in the chat in the show, uh, for those who are watching or listening via podcast, it's boards that irishbreakdown.com is where you can find the Irish Breakdown message board, the Champions Lounge, where we put all of our intel. And I'm I'm still working on the, the Mike Denbrock and Riley Leonard breakdown. So I'm going to have some film breakdowns here over the next couple months of a lot of different things that are going to be a lot of fun and uh, statistical analysis and all that kind of stuff. So you can only get that not on the podcast, not on the not on the YouTube channel, not on the Rumble channel not on the irishbreakdown.com website. You can only find that at the message board at boards.irishbreakdown.com. So, Sean, let's kick off this last section, and this one will be a little bit quicker because the other thing that kind of factors in with Notre Dame is this has just been the most wild offseason that I have seen in a very, very long time. And 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 uh, I, I don't know that I've seen an offseason like this. And it's just the normal portal stuff, not just that, but just – I mean, you got four of your three of your four playoff teams have been completely devastated by departures. All three lost their head coaches. Now, one of them went to another school in the playoff. Kalen DeBoer left Washington to go to Alabama, but their roster lost a ton. Michigan's roster was going to lose a ton no matter what, because they had like 40 some seniors. Now you lose your head coach, and almost the entire defensive staff is now gone. Mike Elson followed him to, to, to the Chargers. Today it was announced that Steve Klingscale was following him to the Chargers. Uh, Jesse Minter followed him to the Chargers. The strength coach followed him to the Chargers. 
So Sharon Moore is going to have to deal with a lot this offseason. Then, of course, Washington was just utterly gutted. They were already going to lose a lot anyway. They were going to lose a Penix. They are going to lose probably mo most of their receiving core, some offensive linemen. But then a lot of guys that were going to come back left because the head coach left. And, the, and, and now the players can just up and leave whenever they feel like it. It, I don't know that I've ever seen an offseason like this. And on top, I mean, and, and you're talking about a couple legends. I mean, Jim Harbaugh is a weird dude, but that guy is a phenomenal football coach and has proven to be so going all the way back to San Diego, where he won at the FCS non scholarship level. Because San Diego is not a scholarship FCS program for people who don't know that. Took over a, a Stanford team that was terrible and rebuilt them, went and took the 40, left there to go to the 49ers. Took them to the NFC Championship game, what, three years in a row? Finally gets to the Super Bowl. And then comes to Michigan, has a lot of good years, couple down years, and then built them right back up and won a national championship. You lost him, great coach. And you lost a legend in Nick Saban. So to see then see Caleb DeBoer leave, you got a new era there. You've got Boston College's head football coach leaves to become a defensive coordinator in the NFL. UCLA's head football coach, Chip Kelly, leaves to go become the offensive coordinator at Ohio State. The job comes open because the guy that they just hired a couple weeks ago, Bill O'Brien, leaves to become the head football coach at Boston College. This has been the nuttiest, Sean, nuttiest offseason that I have seen in a – I don't know that I've ever seen an offseason quite like this, man. And, and for Notre Dame, it's kind of like all the stuff we were just talking about Dude, it's like right there. There's that window, Sean, of Michigan and what they're going through and Bama, what they're going through and Washington and all these things. There's a window there, man, for you to say, okay, we're putting ourselves on this level. And that's going to be, man, that's going to be a question. And will they be able to walk through it? Jack Swarbrick gave a very nice parting gift in this 2024 schedule. Good job. You, you, <laughs> you gave us the tough one. And you said, on my way out the door, I'm going to hand you the opportunity to get right into the expansion of the college football playoff. So everything is setting up. And now, Brian, we've talked about it. it. It is what it is. Like, is you is or is you ain't my baby. That was like a cartoon song from back in the day, right? <laughs> so that's, that's almost the theme of this season, man, for this team. Like. Yo, either you're a championship squad that has a winning culture. You know the amazing thing? You talk about all of those great coaches, and we'll get into why they might be leaving. But some people think it's just as simple as Kirby, Nick, and Jim Harbaugh, or just Kirby and Nick for the sake of five stars. They, they just stack five stars. They're two great developers. Yeah. They're two really good coaches. Like, just don't think that their success is strictly because, I mean, yes, the talent has something to do with it, but both of those guys can coach their tails off. Yes. And that is – Jim Harbaugh can coach his tail off. So you have the, the five-star end of the spectrum, and then you have the other end of the spectrum where your recruiting classes are on average 11th mm -hmm. over the last three years. You know what connects both? Head coaches and a culture that can develop a winning culture within a system. That that's what great coaches do, and that's what we're waiting to see whether or not right. the staff and Marcus Freeman can follow their leads and yeah. bring another championship to Notre Dame. That it simply comes down to that. It's like there is no other. They've proven that they can go out and get talented players, regardless of star rankings. They have improved the talent. And he said he wanted – he said, I don't want one and two. When he got here, he said, I want one A and one B mm -hmm. on the depth chart. That's what we're trying to build. Ladies and gentlemen, this should be the first year where you get that vibe. Inexperienced? Yes. However, yo, what is Gerby Lambert coming into? Let's just use him. Uh, Tosh Baker and Emil Wagner. Like, young man, right. you you might be third on the depth chart. You're a dude. But if but, you want to play, mm -hmm. you got to really raise your level of play. Absolutely. Yeah. It, it's Absolutely. not like when Blake got here and it was like, your Blake was going to start at left tackle because 
There wasn't any. I mean, Tosh was a redshirt freshman. You know, Michael Carmody was not a tackle. I mean, who else is going to play it? That's not to take anything away from Blake. It's it's more so about like you don't want to be in that situation where Charles Jagasaw has to play as a freshman. He wasn't supposed to start the bowl game, but as we talked about the other day, he said, "But I'm going to. <laughs> I'm going to earn that. <laughs> I want that." I mean, like Notre Dame didn't kick Zeke Carroll to the curb just because they felt like it. They did that because Ashton Craig got that opportunity when Zeke got hurt and said, I'm "Not giving his back." Right. I mean, that that's the reality of it. And so you're you're at the point now, Sean, where, yeah, you've got to come and you've got to earn it. And and when you look at kind of just going back to like what's going on, I mean, it just it, it is a great opportunity for Notre Dame. But I, I got to tell you, sometimes, Sean, the miss can end up being a blessing. I, I'm not super high on Bill. O'Brien. I think Bill O'Brien's a solid offensive coordinator. I mean, he, he's a good offensive coordinator, but that's it. He's not. He's not what the reputation, in my opinion, makes him out to be. I just don't think that he is. But he's a good offensive coordinator. I don't think the fit was very good at Ohio State. I don't think his system fit well with Will Howard. I don't think it fit well with just the the what they needed person. I they just, I just don't. I didn't think it was a great hire. He leaves, and now you follow up with what I think was a great hire for Ohio State. And that's the thing that that you know you, you focus on is you you you're going to lose coaches. You're going to lose. I mean, Nick Saban wasn't going to coach forever. He was eventually going to leave. Jim Harbaugh. I mean, Jim Harbaugh's been wanting to go to the NFL for like three years now. This is not a surprise. Jim Harbaugh didn't go to the NFL because he didn't want to deal with NIL and the transfer portal. He's been wanting to go to the NFL since before the transfer portal became a thing, right? I mean, that's just that's just what he wants to do. That's what he's wanted to do because he's a competitor. He wants to prove himself at the highest. He got a taste of it when he was with the Niners and you got to the Super Bowl and lost to his brother. He wants he, he's a competitor, and that's the ultimate. That's the ultimate level. But there's a window that's opened up. But man, I got to tell you, Ohio State, kudos to them. People have kind of said it like disparagingly, like, "Oh, Ohio State's trying to buy themselves a championship." So that's the rules now. Why? Why would? Why would you not? I also think that's a little overplayed. They've only signed like six or seven guys. It's just some of the guys they went out and got were pretty good. I think Will Howard's a, a nice pickup of the portal guys. I'd rather have him over Cam Ward, for example. Uh, they lost out on Riley Leonard, went and you know found a nice uh, consolation prize, right? Similar type of player. Uh, made a great hire on the uh, on the on, on offensive coordinator. But it, it's not just that you hired a great offensive coordinator. As I pointed out the other day, Sean, your offensive line coaches struggled at Ohio State. Justin Fry, in my opinion, is a good offensive line coach. He was a bad fit for Ryan Day because Ryan Day wants to drop back and throw the ball all day and then use the run game as a counter to your pass game. That's not – why you would hire Justin Fry and run that offense is beyond me. But that's who Ryan Day is. But props to Ryan Day for going out and getting a guy like Chip Kelly to run your offense because where did Ryan Day – where did Justin Fry come from? UCLA because he did a great job coaching Chip Kelly's offensive line. So I think you upgraded two positions now with this hire, because I think Chip Kelly's a better offensive coordinator at the college level than Ryan Day, certainly better than Bill O'Brien. And now your offensive line coach is going to be better because his style is going to fit so much better with what you're going to run now system-wise. Because there's no way in heck, no way in heck, Chip Kelly's come to Ohio State and is going to be told what to do. And I don't mean that disrespectfully, like, I'm a I'm Chip, I'm doing my I mean, he's coming here to run his offense, stuff he believes in. Now, are there going to be some maybe some pass game wrinkles that are gonna, of course, and that's okay. That's actually a good thing. But they're gonna be a physical run the football team that's gonna push the tempo. That's what they're gonna do. And now you've got an offensive line coach far better suited for that than what you had when Justin Fry was trying to do what Ryan Day wanted to do. And so, dude, I, I think Ohio State, I mean, are they a team that's a, you know, can they win the title this year? Yeah, they got a shot. You know, I, but but they put their best foot forward this offseason, in my opinion. Not necessarily you know, the, 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 the path you'd want to get there, right? But like, like having T- Travion Henderson and Quinshawn Jukins was not a great – pickup or one-two punch in Bill O'Brien or Ryan Day's offense. It was good, 
But now you're in Chip Kelly's offense where there's going to be enough meat. There's going to be enough meat on that bone expression you like to do, Sean, for both of those backs and Dallin Hayden. You know what I mean? And so that's something to me that I look at. I say now Quinchon Junkins pickup got better because now that 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 workhorse is still going to be a workhorse, but now there's going to be even more of some of the other stuff. And I think Travion is going to is going to thrive in Chip Kelly's offense if he can stay healthy. And you still got Jim Knowles and what they got coming back on defense. So I think Ohio State put their best foot forward. Now they got to still show us that they can go play toe to toe with teams that can that like Michigan and not just get their face kicked in. But I think if you're trying to change that persona of you're soft and Ryan Day is soft, Chip Kelly is a lot of things, and not all of them positive. One expression I've never used for Chip Kelly and would laugh at anyone if they did try to use it on Chip Kelly, soft. There's nothing soft about the way that guy plays football. Even back when they were at Oregon and they were up-tempo, they were a running football team. They played for a national title with Darren Thomas. He ain't Marcus Mariota throwing the football. You know what I mean? And they played for a title and, and, and were close to winning that game as well. Let's not, that was a good football game against, against Auburn. So I, I think it's a really, really good hire. Really, really good hire. That, that doesn't mean Ohio State's now the presumed favorite because they still got a lot to, just like Notre Dame, they still got a lot to prove. Yeah, you made some good moves, but he's still your head coach. And he still got to show me, well, Jim Harbaugh's gone. Well, Jim Harbaugh wasn't on the sidelines when Ohio State got their butts kicked in the fourth quarter, physically got their butts kicked. Sharon Moore was on the sideline. Let's be real about that. So there's still they something they have to show, but I do think that Ohio State had about as good of an offseason as they could have had, including some guys coming back. JT came back. Denzel Burke came back. Those are nice. Those are good. Those are good, I mean, important guys to get back. So I think Ohio State is, of all the of all the powerhouses, I think Ohio State probably had the best offseason as far as making themselves better than where they were, just on paper, roster-wise. How much pressure have they applied to themselves, though? That's that, the rub, Sean. That is, that, that's a lot of pressure because you have to feel like new athletic director comes in, new mindset, possibly a conversation with Ryan Day, similar to a conversation that was had in 2000, after the 2016 season to say, hey, you might want to think about making some changes. You might want to take a step back from calling plays and actually be the head coach. Because like, let's be real, Sean. For Ohio State, going 11-2 and two and losing for a third straight year to Michigan is about the same as Notre Dame going 4-8 in 2016 oh, as far as a fan pressure, fan perception. Absolutely. I mean, you got Chip, you got Ryan Day, who's never lost more than two games in a season. People talking about he, he might get fired. Right. So that's pressure enough. Now you went out and made these moves. You got Caleb Downs, you got Quinshaw Junkins, you got Will Howard, you got Chip Kelly. You got all these guys coming back because you're giving them NIL deals, which I have no problem with. I think that's smart. Uh, I got no problem with the kids. I mean, th- these are all things I don't, I don't. Like, have anything negative to say about these moves Ohio State's making? Good on them. More teams need to do that. More teams need to do that, right? But here's the deal. The pressure on you to make a deep run in the playoff just skyrocketed. Because if your offense is really good this year and you fall short again, don't think there won't be some Ohio State fans. I wonder if Chip Kelly could do a better job than Ryan Day. <laughs> You know what I'm Don't saying? Don't think Chip Kelly didn't <laughs> didn't think about that making the moves from exactly. UCLA. Exactly. Like, I would exactly. much rather be the head coach here in the Big Ten than the head coach at UCLA in, in the, the Big, Big Ten. Ten. Absolutely oh, absolutely. Right. Absolutely right. So, yes, the pressure on Ohio State is enormous. I mean, and I'm I'm even curious, Sean, if a semifinal run would even be enough for their fans. I'm. I don't know. I mean, I genuinely don't I, know. I wonder if they like. They have to get to the title game and play. This well. is a. This is championship or bust. Yeah. Like well, you I, make this type of look. You, Ryan Day was the main one complaining about NIL. He was the main one complaining about how much it costs. And well, then they, they pony up. They pony up and give you what you've been asking for. Because let's be honest. Can we be honest? Ohio State never has a talent problem. Even on the offensive line. No. Their offensive line is not struggling because they don't have any good players. 
No. They're not coached well, and it's a soft mindset. It's right. a soft yes. mindset because of Ryan Day. Simple as that. The offensive line is not going to have elite talent like it did in 2021 with DeWan Jones, and but there's plenty enough talent on the offensive line at Ohio State for them to have a good Chip Kelly offensive line. Mm -hmm. Right? That's the thing is, like, well, they didn't do a lot to address the trenches. True from a player standpoint, but my whole point is there was nothing they could have done in the transfer portal that was going to better address the way they are in the trenches than hiring Chip Kelly. That's yeah. the whole, that's the thing. Like Notre Dame went from a pin and pull, you know, not a real physical team in 2011 and 2010 on the offensive line with the same exact players in 2020 to a physical 12 and 0 team. What was yeah. the only thing that changed? Harry, he stand. Yep. That's it. That's it. Notre Dame went from a soft offensive line in 2021 to a team that could kick the ever-living crap out of Clemson in 2022 because of what? Harry Heastan, right? I mean, so my point is you can take the same players who aren't coached well and don't have the right mentality, coach them up, prepare the right mentality, teach them how to play, and teach them how to play technically and then from a physicality standpoint, and those same players are going to get a lot better. Right. And yeah. and I would I would point to Michigan as an example. Look at the difference in Michigan's offensive line the moment Sharon Moore got promoted from tight ends coach to offensive line coach. That talent didn't change a whole lot. It was the same players. They went from a joke offensive line in 2020 to the best offensive line overall over three years. Now I don't think they had the best offensive line this year, but as far as just as a whole. Who, as a whole, taking the three years together, has played better in the offensive line in the last years in Michigan? Nobody. Maybe a team this year was better, and team, but just the consistency. The cumulative, what, yeah. What was the difference? Were there any highly ranked recruits there? No. Sharon no. Moore is be, it, Jim Harbaugh and Sharon Moore established a culture, and then Sharon Moore knew how to carry it out and got them to play tough, physical, sound football. That's my point, is why I think because. I do think Justin Fry is a good football. He 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 had success under Steve Adazio at Boston College, mm -hmm. creating really physical lines. He had success creating really good offensive lines at UCLA, which is why Ohio State hired him. The problem is, again, it's the same question I have about USC. I think Deanton Lynn was a good hire. I think the D line, D line was hiring Belk is a, all good hires, but you still have the same problem you've always had, Lincoln Riley. Ryan Day was still the problem at Ohio State, but bringing in, to me, Chip Kelly and letting him run his offense fixes that problem, and the biggest problem was you were soft. Your head coach was soft. Your offense was soft. That was it. And 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 now that you've got a coach in here that says, we're not going to play that way, right? If, if the kids buy in, then they won't be. That doesn't mean they're going to win a championship. Yeah, you know, because they don't have CJ Stroud at quarterback. But let's be honest. So it's it's going to be interesting, Sean, to see Ohio State, and then Alabama is an interesting case too because I know it's not sexy, but I think Kalen DeBoer was about as good of a hire as they could have made, realistically made. I mean, you could say, well, Bill Belichick or you know, Dab, whatever. I mean, realistically speaking, you hired you hired a really darn good football coach. There's some questions about, however. Not every coach can fit in every part of the country. And there's one part of the country that tends to be a little harder to fit in for some people than others. Let's be honest about that. That's going to be the big question to Alabama. Is that right there? That's I think Alabama, I'm going to be interested in seeing, because I think they take a step back. I just want to know how big the step is going to be. They're going to take a step back. How big a step is it going to be? And then on top of that, you know, Ohio State, Michigan, uh, what is this new Big Ten going to look like, right? Mm -hmm. More difficult schedules. Really, three teams in the Big Ten East, now that that won't exist as well, had two, two games per year. Michigan had Penn State, Ohio State. Penn State had Ohio State, Michigan. And Ohio State had Penn State and Michigan. Like, those, those are the two games you worry about. Those are the two games you worried about. So now that changes. Right. And now you add some tougher competition. Well, Washington was supposed to be tough, but now with Kalen DeBoer down in Alabama, how does that play out? The someone we talk about culture being tested. 
the Clemson culture has been tested. How does Dabo recover? Well, Dabo, you're facing Kirby and an upset Bulldog team. <laughs> they felt like they should have won three in a row. They returned a quarterback, some pretty good talent on the offensive line. Like, how does Clemson look? This season is going to be so wide open. And right now, you can say, okay, maybe Ohio State, roster-wise, is that dominant team. But you could really just look at the landscape and say, or has a chance to be that dominant team. Yeah. Maybe but, Georgia has a chance to be that dominant team. Here's the can I say something about this? Like Ohio State, Sean. To me, something the chat said, and I agree, this isn't even Ohio State's most talented roster in recent years. And I completely agree mm. with that. Here's the difference, though. I think this team with Chip Kelly and Jim Knowles as coordinators has a better chance of getting the most out of the talent they do have. That's the difference. So they won't have the team they had in 2021 talent wise. But I think they have a chance to be a better team mm -hmm. than they were in 2021. That's the difference. Because it's not always about the roster. It's about what did you like, – perfect example. 2015, to me, was by far Notre Dame's best roster. It was not Notre Dame's best team. It wasn't even their second best team. I would argue it might not even be their third best team. It just was their most talented team but you didn't have the strength program or the defensive coordinator situation to maximize your talent. The 28 team was a way better team than the 2015 team, even though it didn't have the same level of talent. They had very good talent. Don't get me wrong, but they, I mean, Ian book versus Deshaun Kaiser, right? Like Will Fuller versus miles Boykin. You know what I mean? Like the offensive line was 2015, Ronnie Stanley, Quentin Nelson, Nick Martin, Steve Elmer, Mike McGlinchey. Verse 2018, Liam Eikenberg is a first-year starter. Aaron Banks is a first-year starter. Talented guys, but first-year starters. You know, Sam Mustafer, Alex Bars, who then got hurt, and, you know, with Tommy Kramer and Robert Hainsey, right? I mean, that, that was a good line. Wasn't what it was in 2015, right? Defensively, you had Drew Tranquil, Tavon Coney, really good football players. They weren't Jalen Smith, right? Like So, so that's my point, Sean, is like, the roster doesn't always determine how good you are. I, I think Ohio State's thing is, is the part of the reason that I'm – if I'm an Ohio State fan, I'm excited about these moves, is not because, oh, wow, our roster now is the best in college football. It's not. I don't think it's a top four roster per se. It's in the conversation. But it's not in a, It's not what they were in 2021. I just think this team now is in better is better positioned to get the most out. Of, and Michigan is the perfect example. Michigan did not have a top four roster this year. Just – God-given, high-level talent. Ohio State had a better roster than Michigan this year, in my opinion. I don't think that's debatable. But they weren't a better team than Michigan. That's the difference. And I think now they have a better shot of, of getting the most out of themselves as a team. That's what I'm saying. And, and that's what Dan Lanning has done at Oregon. I mean, yeah, he's got some portal guys, but he walked into a pretty good situation. The difference is, is – for a young, I mean, kudos to him, young coach, like first time head coach. He knew how to get the culture the where it needed to be. What culture did he come from? See that bingo, bingo. What culture did he come exactly. from? Georgia, Georgia. And he'd also been under Saban for a minute at, at Alabama, mm -hmm. right? And so that's the thing is like, it's not always about what your roster is, it's can you get the most. And that's the big question about Notre Dame. This is going to be their most talented roster that they've had in, in several years, in my opinion. But do you have the – are you in position to get the most out of it? And that, that is – that's a great point because Oregon's culture has been tested, right? Because that you bring that Alabama-Georgia Georgia culture to the Pac-12 and automatically you think it's going to be beneficial when you add that to the recruiting. But they couldn't get over the Washington, Washington hump. They couldn't get over the Kalen DeBoer hump for two straight seasons, three straight losses, right? So, Dan Lanning, do you say to yourself, oh, man, we got to match. Now we got to match teams. We're going to the Big Ten. We have to do this. We have to make this change. No, 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 no. Just tweaks. It's moments in games. Moments in the Oregon games that we, we didn't make the plays. They made the plays. That's going to be the difference moving forward. And it's the same thing that applies for all teams that feel like they have a good roster. It's going to be moments for Ohio State. Lost the moment in the fourth quarter to Michigan last year. 
they could have beat one that game. But when push came to shove and it was the moment, Michigan won. Michigan lost their captain, and they watched their captain of their team season ended. And career the very and career ended. And the very next snap, they destroyed the Ohio State defensive line with their head coach. Yes, watching from watching home. from home. Yes, that's, that's culture. That's buy-in. Right. It's almost like you, Brian. The proof of parents is not how kids act when their parents are around. When your parents leave, how do your kids act? And, 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 and yes, and that's and, that's where Notre. That's the question about Notre Dame, mm -hmm. and, and that, that still needs to get answered. But like the the whole thing about this whole off season, though, Sean is, man, this it's like if you're Marcus Freeman, you have to be loving what's going on right now. Not not that you like want to win with the. It's just that look, all the oxygen was being sucked out of the room by certain people, right? And Dabo was doing it for a while. And yeah, Dabo's still there, but you've kind of you've cut, you know, it's like Rocky Four, right? Like 2022, Notre Dame, they they live they delivered that blow in what round three, round four, where it's like the unbeatable has now been bloodied. They're not dead yet, but the knockout's coming, right? Notre Dame did that with Clemson. Now they got their payback this year, but like again, I love the Rocky Four reference. Rocky didn't dominate the rest of the fight. Drago came right back at him, right? I mean, you, what, you that, that's the reality of it. So you've bloodied them, but Georgia, Bama, Ohio State, just sucking all the oxygen out of the room. And now, and Michigan has kind of emerged as the best team in the Midwest. Notre Dame was trying to be that team. Michigan has become that team. Now you're at best third because Ohio State's still ahead of you. We can talk about Jim Harbaugh, I mean, about Ryan Day being soft, still beat Notre Dame twice. I mean, it's the reality of it. So you're now competing for that, and 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 things are opening up for you. Your schedule's more manageable, <laughs> best way of putting it, but not soft either. You know what I mean? Like, you'll be tested, but you're not going to be tested like you were in 2022 or 2023, right? You're not going to be tested like you were in 2017. Saban's gone, right? I mean, Harbaugh's gone. There's just the Big Ten and the the Big Ten and the SEC are going to be far more competitive leagues now than they have been in recent years, where Georgia's had some soft schedules for the most part, and and Bama and Georgia always seem to kind of avoid each other every except every five six years. The Big Ten scheduling in conference was weak, not and not because they purposely avoided teams. It's just because the league as a whole the last few years has just been not very good outside the top three teams. Let's just be honest about that. It's the occasional Michigan State that pops up, but it, it's been a Ohio State, Michigan, Penn State deal for a while, and the rest of the league is just not good. Well, that's you're now bringing in Washington and USC and UCLA and Oregon, especially Oregon now, and you look at the SEC and the SEC's added some really good coaches in recent years, Sean. Like some really, you went from Brian Harson to Hugh Freeze at Auburn. That's a big upgrade, big upgrade. You went from Ed Orgeron to Brian Kelly. That's an upgrade, in my opinion, in a lot of ways. Now, can he win a title like Orgeron did? I don't think so. But as far as LSU is going to be good every year, I just don't think they're going to win a title. That's what I've said about Brian Kelly. So that's a good football team. You now add Texas and Oklahoma to the SEC. Eli Drinkwitz is doing a really nice job at Missouri. Mark Stoops has done a really steadily good job at Kentucky. Josh Heupel's building something really good at Tennessee. That league has gotten a lot better, and now you're bringing in the, the Texas and Oklahoma. And, and so, I mean, you could make a case that a newcomer might be the favorite to win both of those leagues in 2024. I don't know that I would make that if I would necessarily say that that's what I think is true, but you can make a case that Georgia, that Oregon's the best team in the Big Ten this year. I mean, most people are going to put Ohio State ahead of them, but I think Oregon – needs to be in that conversation. Let's not forget the last two times these teams played in Columbus, Oregon punched them in the mouth. Right? Let's not forget that. And then and then Texas to me and Georgia are the two top teams in the SEC. We could debate who should be number 1. I'd probably go with Georgia, but Texas is going to be in the conversation. So I think and you look at the schedule, Sean, like the schedules are brutal. 
I mean, it's like for as bad as Michigan's schedule was this year, they're making up for it in 2024. They got Texas on it, Oregon on it, Washington on it. I mean, it's going to be rough at Ohio State. And it's just that window for no, it, it's not, it's not just Notre Dame though. It's, it's windows, the windows opening for Dan Lang and, and Oregon too. A window's opening up for Sark at Texas as well. Mm-hmm. You know, a window's opening up for Dabo to kind of get back to it. I mean, you go, people say, oh, Dabo, you can't recruit in this era. Uh, have you watched what he's doing in 2025? Because he's doing some things in the 2025 class now. Getting back to his roots. Things. Getting right. back to his roots. Right. Right. Yeah. He's recognizing, like, because I think from a coaching philosophy standpoint, you talked about it because it impacts why Bo Collins might actually be at Notre Dame. Yeah, sometimes you, it, everybody thinks, yo, it might have been, I'm sure Nick Saban was nervous about the offense evolving because he always said, dude, I don't want to make a bunch of mistakes. But here he goes and says, you know, we're going to have to open it up offensively. Right. We're going to have to throw the ball more. We're going to have to take more chances, go get some of these wide receivers. And he was able to win, right? But how do you keep that culture when you have to make a change over here? I don't think the core of Alabama's program ever changed and what they were going to be about. Right. How it looked and how they went about it changed. Yes. Offensively and defensively. They're not the three, yes. four. The two thumpers guys. in the middle. Yeah. Right. And right. being able to adjust. I talked, I told to you about the SEC championship game after the first series. He's like, everything we did all week to prepare, scrap it. Scrap mm-hmm. it. In order for us to have a chance, this is what we have to do. Like that is Marcus Freeman is going to have a moment in this season in a game where he's gonna have to say, Look, I know what. I know what we said we were going to do. We're going to have to do this. And that is his part of his maturation as a head coach, being able to tell, uh, not make a play call per se, but being able to tell the offensive coordinator, hey, we're going to run the ball here. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to run the ball here. Or we're going to take a shot here. We This, this, is, this is what we're going to need to do. And the, those type of things, I'm telling you, man, look, Georgia, basically, Carson Beck not being ready for the moment is really what stopped them. They did, Stetson Bennett made those plays two consecutive years. Yeah, his, his, fumble, his fumble in the third quarter and another mistake. He, two, he made two mistakes all game, Brian. It wasn't like he had yeah. a horrible game. He made two key mistakes. Well, it's that, and he couldn't make the plays. That as well. That you, and you were talking about this earlier with Notre Dame. He couldn't make those. And again, that's not a knock because Stetson Bennett couldn't make them his first year as a starter in 2020 either, right? When he took over for JT Daniels in 2020. So, um, yeah, you, you're you're correct there, Sean. I mean, but like when you when you look at like Clemson, we talk about Clemson. It's it's you said Dabble going back to his roots to a degree. He's still going to need to kind of turn the offense over a little bit and be willing to change that. But the that's the thing is Dabo kind of has this, we're going to run this system that's worked for us. Nick Saban had a philosophy that worked, but how that philosophy got impl- that got carried out changed. And and that's what Dabo has to kind of be willing to adjust a little bit. I think he is, but they're, they're recruiting. I mean, and they're not, they're not, they're recruiting their butts off in 20. I thought their 2024 class was very underrated. I like their 2024 class quite a bit. Their 2025 class is off to a great start. Mm-hmm. And, and so, but that's the thing is like Clemson has a window to get back, right? Notre Dame has a window to enter into the mix. Michigan had a window the last couple of years and they took advantage of it, kicked the door down and said, we are here, whether yeah. you like it or not, right? Props to them for doing so. Can Notre Dame do that? Can Oregon do that? Because Dan Lanning's done a lot of good things, except for one thing. He hasn't beat the best teams in the league. Mm-hmm. Dan Lanning has not been as good when he plays teams that can somewhat match them talent for talent. Now, that's partly because he's a young coach. He, like Marcus Freeman, he's going to get better. Is this the year now that he gets better at that? That that was not meant to be a shot at Dan Lanning because Notre Dame's had a similar issue with Marcus Freeman. That's that's that evolution as a young coach because when it's close, Kalen DeBoer is going to be able to outcoach Dan Lanning. That's what happened, right? But as Dan Lanning is doing this longer, he'll learn from those mistakes. Yeah, I want to be aggressive, but I should have taken points at the end of the first half against Washington. There's aggressive, and then there's smart. 
and finding that balance, right? He won't make that same mistake again, in my opinion. And, and so those are all parts of this of this evolution, Sean. But the point is, is the changes have opened up windows. And I'm very curious in 2024 and the playoff format. Because, you know, Florida State in 2024 goes into the playoff pissed off and hungry and dangerous in a way that they couldn't in 2023. If we had a 12-team playoff in 2024, I'd have been like, Florida State ain't winning at all because they don't have Jordan Travis, but I would not want to play them in the first two rounds because they won't need their quarterback to win those two games Yeah, because they're just going to come out there and be pissed off and just out-talent you all day. Yeah. You know what I mean? And eventually, the, no, the not having Jordan Travis would have caught up to him. Yeah. But now, when you have that bad loss, you can now say, hey, we we got to buckle down and go do this thing. Mm-hmm. Who is going to take advantage of those opportunities? That's what I'm curious to see. Does Missouri take that next step in the East or whatever they are in now? Does Penn State finally take that? Because that's another team that the window's opening up for. Hey, man, this is we got a great we got a, a lot of talent coming back. We I think they made a great offensive coordinator hire. I really like the Tom Allen hired defensive coordinator. I really, I think he was a very good defensive coordinator. Yeah. He's just not a very good head coach. He's a good recruiter, very good defensive mind, great guy. You know, like, do they take advantage of, of this opening that's happening with, in college football with Michigan and Bama? And those, we're going to find out. Can Notre Dame? And that's what's to me is going to be the, the, the partly what makes this year so exciting on top of all the talk about the expanded playoff. Yeah. Is is this are we are we seeing a shift in college football? I think a lot of people think we are, but I'm not ready to I'm not ready to just assume that Kalen DeBoer, who's got a, like a almost 900 win percentage as a head football coach, is all at the because he's all of a sudden Bama's gonna be mediocre now. Yeah. Uh I'm not ready to I'm not ready to write that obituary yet. You know what I mean? I'm not completely ready to say. Just like I'm not completely ready to say that Texas is going to build on what they did last year. Are they going to do that or are they going to be TCU? Which one are they going to be? I don't know. It's and going to be fascinating. It really is. There's something else. And I, someone in the chat said this, you know, and this this plays into culture and walking through that door, not just for other teams, but for a, something you talked about. Being led, but also being a player accountability and player-led program especially in tough situations that's the that's a, another step notre dame needs to take on the marcus freeman because yeah. someone's talking about like yo georgia was missing their three top receivers or they were injured and i guarantee you kirby's like well, i don't give a darn about that if we don't fumble and turn the ball over and give them 10 points we win this game there is no excuse in this culture injuries are not an excuse all the excuses that everybody, you know, we did the post game show. Everybody had a reason other than 10 for why Notre Dame lost to Clemson. Mm-hmm. Everybody played a part. All I know is as bad as they played, they had opportunities in the third, fourth quarter to win that game. See, good teams win games when they play bad. That's what good teams, that's what elite teams do. Clemson won with 10, with what, eight starters out? Injured, they found a way. Their culture found a way to come to the forefront in a big Their game. Their backs were against the wall, and Absolutely. they fought back. Absolutely. Notre Dame's backs got against the wall against Ohio State and Louisville, and they didn't. And they didn't. That's the difference. Absolutely. Now, now, do they become that? Because t- here's the thing. Texas was that team in 2022. Mm-hmm. They were that team that almost won this game, that game, the other game. They couldn't quite get it done. Then they go out this year. They lose to Tech, Oklahoma, and instead of pouting, they went out and just rolled. Mm-hmm. Lost their starting quarterback for a stretch. Rolled. You know, it's like something in the chat earlier said. Well, you know, will you be able to blame Brian Kelly or Tommy Reese if Riley Leonard gets hurt? I'm like, no, because you've got Steve Angeli, Kenny Minchie, and CJ C. Carr. If you can't find one competent quarterback among that group to be better than what you had in 2022. Mm-hmm. Then you don't have the right coaches. I think they do. So no, I'm not gonna, you know, plus, okay, fine. For the next couple of games with Riley Leonard out, 
there's this kid named Jeremiah Love and this kid named Jadarian Price and this kid named Jabron Payne and this other cat named Kedron Young that are pretty freaking good. And you got a bunch of 320, 330 pounders up there. How about you just rely on him a little bit and not have to, this kid do as much, right? I mean, we saw Mike Denbrock set a Notre Dame all-time record in yards per play in 2015 in a year in which by the end of the second game, the second game of the year, by the end of the second game, they had lost a starting quarterback, starting tailback, and starting tight end for the year, for the year, and still went out and said that. Why? I, you think Mike Denbrock was like, hey, guys, we're not going to be able to be the team we thought we were going to be because we lost Malik and we lost Torian and we lost. And he said, no, hey, guys, next man up. Let's roll. Mm -hmm. Sean, now it's your turn. Same thing here. Right? I mean, remember how everybody's like, oh, my God, if Malik Zaire gets hurt, Notre Dame is screwed because Deshaun Kaiser had a bad spring game. And I kept saying, guys, they're going to be fine. I don't care about the spring game. They're going to be fine. I don't want Malik to get hurt, but they're going to be fine. And then Malik got hurt, and they were fine. Now, were they as good as they would have been with Malik? I don't think they were. I've said this part. I think they beat Stanford and Clemson. I think they're 12-0 if Malik's the starting quarterback. Now, would they have won in the postseason? I don't know about that. But I think they would have beat Stanford at the end because I don't think Malik would have turned the ball over the way Deshaun did. And I do think they'd have beat Clemson because they'd have been able to run the ball with Malik at quarterback in that mm -hmm. game, in the rain. You know, maybe there's another game they would have lost if Malik played. Maybe they'd have gone left. I mean, who knows, right? But you you didn't use it as an excuse. That's the no. difference. no. And so I'm just excited for this season, man, just for what Notre Dame can do. I'm curious to see what Clemson's going to do. I'm curious to see what Oregon's going to do. Like, how's this new look Big Ten going to be? I was excited about what – I mean, I'm sitting there thinking, like, dude, you're bringing Kalen DeBoer and Chip Kelly and Lincoln Riley and and Dan Lanning into the Big Ten. Now it's like, nope, you're just bringing in Lincoln Riley and, and, and Dan Lanning. You know, who knows what UCLA's bringing in now. And, you know, I, I think Jed Fish is – a good hire there but I, I need to see more than just one good year from jed fish you know what i mean yeah. i mean that and and so it, it's just going to be a fascinating year sean and that's why i wanted to we wanted to kick the the first rtcf show off with kind of talking about this because it has been such a wacky year but again there's a there's an opportunity there for notre dame oregon penn state texas tennessee teams like that to say hey the big dogs are bruised. They're battered a little bit. This is our chance, right? Like, let's be honest. Everybody talk, you know, Georgia would have beat Michigan. I, I don't think so. Guys, let's not act like Georgia wasn't losing like at halftime in like half their games last year. Let's not talk about how they kind of got outplayed for a while by Georgia Tech. They were down 14 to three at halftime against South Carolina. Let's not act like, oh, Georgia. This isn't 2022, 2021 Georgia, folks. No. And this and, wasn't 2021 Michigan either. And so Georgia's going to still be good, but they're not a given to be a championship team this year, in my opinion. No. So there's an opportunity. And now they could. Please, oh. please don't take this as me saying Georgia won't be. I'm saying this: th there is not a an elite team in college football right now. Can Ole Miss and Lane Kiffin be that team with the portal success they had? Go ahead, Sean. What were you going to say? No, no, no. I, look. You were spot on. You're simply saying you're not – there's no guarantee for Georgia, but I guarantee you believe in Kirby and the culture. Well, well, exactly. But I, see, I guarantee you, I, you believe in that. Georgia's not going to say, well, man, Lane, you had a great offseason, man. We can't compete with that. Here you go. Here's the crown to the SEC. No. No. Just like Kalen DeBoer's not going to come in and say, hey, I ain't Nick Saban, so we're just going to hope that eight and four is good enough. Mm -hmm. Right. To, so, yes, yeah, Sean, like – Georgia's vulnerable, but you got to take it. You got to take it's it. It's like one of the greatest sports. Like everybody talks about all that. That all any given Sunday pregame. That was a t boring, you know, that inch. That's lame. You want to know what a great speech was? Go watch Miracle and watch Herb Brooks before the, the, the Olympic semifinal game against Russia. It's your moment. It's there. Take it. Take it. Right, because George is not going to give it to him. No, you got to take it. No, but and you that, just gave and, testimony. Right, but that's what this year was. Mm -hmm. Georgia was vulnerable, but nobody was willing to take it from them until the legend said, "We got this." Mm -hmm. Guess what, though, folks? The legend's gone. Right, George's not going to hand it to you. No, you're going to have right? to beat him. 
Michigan's, you have to beat them. Michigan's gonna go hand. Hey, we lost Harbaugh. This uh, we're uh, well, we're we're back to eight and four again. No. May, maybe they will, but it, but you better earn it because Michigan's not gonna say, "Well, we're you know it's a bounce back year." No, mm-hmm. right? That's the thing, Sean. Is like if Penn State wants to step into that void, they got to take it. They got to seize it. It's not these other teams coming down and just giving you stuff. You got to earn it. And that's what we don't know. We don't know if Texas can do that. We don't know if Oklahoma can do that. We don't know if Oregon can do that. We don't know if Clemson can get back to doing that. And that's the whole thing with Dabble. It's like, ACC, you had your chance. You had your chance. And you really couldn't You couldn't put the death nail into Clemson. You had your chance, but you didn't take advantage of it, right? And so that's what we're going to see. Like, it's it's going to be – man, Sean, I'm telling you, this is going to be a fun – Fun freaking year of football, man. Yeah. It is. And we're going to find out, is Marcus Freeman capable of leading a team to that where they'd say, hey, screw this. We know you're not going to give it to us, but it doesn't matter because we're taking it from you. We're mm-hmm. not going to ask nicely either. There won't be a negotiation. It's just we're coming and we're going to punch you in the face and we're going to take it. You know, the, the thing about like Notre Dame 1988, Sean, Rocket Ismail gave the best – sort of explanation of what that moment meant because what he was saying, it was an interview he did a number of years ago with Aaron Taylor. And he said, Miami had this reputation of scaring you before the game even started. And they would like run right through your drills and all that kind of stuff. And, and they would just intimidate people and they'd intimidated Notre Dame. They beat Notre Dame like what? 27, nothing the year before. Mm -hmm. But that Notre Dame team said, "Uh uh-uh, we don't give a crap what's on your helmet we don't care how many games you've won. We don't care what happened next last year. We're Notre Dame, and we are taking this from you. Miami didn't give it to them. Notre Dame took it. Mm-hmm. And and that's that's the thing, Sean. I mean, Florida State didn't just hand over their crown to the Clemson. Clemson had to earn it, right? Georgia did not. Bama did not hand Georgia the crown. Georgia took it. They took it. And that's the thing. And we're going to find out if Notre Dame, Penn State, Oregon, Texas, Ole Miss, if these teams can do that in 2024, because it's there for the taking. Yeah. But they're not going to give it away, y'all. No. And here's the thing. If you don't, if you don't cut Georgia more this year, <laughs> you run the risk of Kirby getting that sucker right back to Reloading. it. Reloading. Yes, and putting some serious distance between them and everybody else. Because like you just said, you gave all of those things of why Georgia really wasn't as good as people might have thought. But they think about it. Yeah, they won. They won. Wait a minute. Brock Bowers, your best player. Remember that somebody, t- you know, was talking about Carson Beck, Beck in the chat. Go check out Carson Beck's games without Bowers. Because remember, that was supposed to be the test of Carson Beck. Uh-oh, they got some tough games coming up, and they won't have Brock Bowers. Those were three of his best games of the yeah. season without Brock Bowers. Because other dudes stepped up, too. Other dudes stepped including up. Including Carson Beck, yeah. And, I mean, a kid we're familiar with, right? They lose their starting right tackle. Oh, here's Monroe Freeland. <laughs> a kid that Notre Dame was recruiting that ended up in Georgia as a true freshman being part of that depth on the offensive line. See? Yo, that's – Notre Dame on a soft schedule. But you coach the game, Brian. Notre Dame's going to play their game. Like, yo, they were on today. What, 50% of the schedule? Maybe 60% of the time? They're going to have to win when they're not at their best. Yeah. Three, four times this year. Maybe five. That, it, that's That's winning. That's national. Go what? How many games did Michigan not look good this year? Oh, several. Several. Now it helped that the teams that they didn't look good against weren't weren't as good either. Yeah, yeah. But they Washington weren't, didn't look good. Sean, Michigan wasn't even close to being their best against Mich- against Alabama. Mm-hmm. They they kind of peed down their leg a little bit in the first quarter. I mean, you, you had to mm-hmm. pick on the first play of the game. It luckily got overturned. You had to fumble. I mean, Michigan. But again, it just they Lou Holtz always said, ne- "Don't flinch." That's the difference. Michigan flinched against TCU. They flinched against Georgia two years ago. They didn't flinch this year against Bama. Mm-hmm. That's the difference. Ohio State was out playing Michigan early in that game. They were. 
But the difference is, is Michigan said, this is a 60-minute game. I don't care that you're winning in the third quarter. It doesn't matter if you're winning in the third quarter because we're going to be winning at the end of the game. There was ne- But when, when Ohio State kind of had that chance to put that game away, they flinched. Mm-hmm. And Michigan said, you had your chance. Mm-hmm. Now it's over. Right? And, and, and so Penn State this year, no Jim Harbaugh. I mean, you're at home. It's a, you know, it's a big game, wide out, whatever. They you can't pass chance. the ball. They can't throw the ball to save their life. You had your chance, and Michigan mm-hmm. said, sorry. You're not us. So, I mean, it, all that stuff, man, it's like that's what's so great about this sport, man. It, it, it's because it's still the ultimate team sport, in my opinion, Sean. And and coaching is so important in, in football. It, yeah. it is. And, you know, it's the players that matter. No, it's both. We've seen yeah. a lot of teams with the same players, you know, Notre Dame 16 versus Notre Dame 17. Same play, actually less players. Notre Dame 2011 versus Notre Dame 2012. Not nearly as talented of a roster in 2012, in my opinion. No Michael Floyd, no Harrison Smith, no Darius Fleming. You know, no, lost all those guys. No Trevor Robinson, no Jonas Gray. Way better team. Yeah, Cam McDaniels, he he echoed that. Yeah. In a recent conversation. He was like, 2011 was the most talented team I was on in Notre Dame. Oh, easily. Easily. And I was like, really? He was like, oh, yeah. He was like, yeah. He was like, if there were reasons why we didn't win – the way we should have, but easily. The you, most had, you had a 24-7 lead in the fourth quarter against Michigan, and you blew it because mm-hmm. you weren't a good team. That yeah. Notre Dame 2012 team in that same scenario puts Michigan away. Mm-hmm. That's the difference. Yeah. Right? Michigan 2021, the the, the bad start against Alabama, it, it snowballs, and they lose. Michigan 2022 has the bad start against Alabama, and it snowballs, and they lose. But mm-hmm. Michigan 2023 had been through those wars and said, guys, we're fine. We're not going to flinch this time. Let's go out there and do, let's do – we're not playing our game. Simple fix. Get back to playing our game. Yeah. It's, it's easy, and they did it. And you, the week the week schedule stuff for Michigan, they beat Alabama and Washington. Right. Th- that only like, goes dude, so far. Like, you can't – Cheat I, yourself to – you can't cheat yes. yourself to a national championship. I don't want to hear that stuff. Dude. They had to beat Penn State on the road. Yeah, They had to beat Ohio State. They had to beat Alabama. They had to beat Washington. Again, does the week schedule put you in a position to be on that stage? Yes. Maybe Michigan doesn't get to the college football playoff, Sean, if their schedule is tougher. That's fair. We don't know the answer to that. We don't. Yeah. Because the thing about Michigan is I think sometimes they played down to their competition a little bit early, and then they would put teams away. There was a level of consistency with Michigan this year that was a little different past years too. But once you got to the last game of the regular season, the whole easy schedule might have helped to get you there, but you still had to beat Ohio State. Mm -hmm. You still had to beat Bama. You still had to beat Washington. And only one of those games is at home. I mean, so, look. I don't. I dislike Michigan a ton. You, everybody knows that. I hate Michigan, but I'm also not going to take. The, the, I'm not look what they did in the postseason. Sean took away any of the other. I mean, do they should they have been there because of the cheating? That's a whole different conversation. That's a totally different. different day, I'm talking about right? what happened they, on the football right. field. Michigan stealing signs in 2021. If that was happening, and I believe that it was, is not why Aiden Hutchinson absolutely physically beat the crap out of the Ohio State offensive lineman. No, it's not why. It's not why. And so, but, but man, Michigan had the chance to seize it, and they did. Clemson had a chance to seize it in 2015 and 2016 against Notre Dame and Florida State. Then they got the rematch against Bama, and they seized it. Yes. Georgia had a chance to take down the King in 2021 and 2022, and they seized it. Right? You have to get, at some point in time, you have to take down the big dog if you want to get there. There's a lot of teams that have that chance this year, Sean. We're off. Notre Dame's last title, Lou Holtz is not the legend that we think he is or that we believe him to be now because somebody gave him something. Yeah. They had to t- they had to slay the giant, right? Yeah. They had to slay Goliath. Little old Notre Dame, private school, whatever. All the you know, not fat, all this other nonsense people said. 
dynasty's over. They can't win anymore. Blah, 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 blah. Miami's too good. 30 straight regular season wins, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Notre Dame said, okay, we'll, we'll, we'll take that David versus Goliath role nicely. Mm-hmm. And we'll, we're going to punch you. We're going we're gonna to come out and we're going to punch you in the face because we're bigger, badder, and better than you. Now, I don't know if they were, but they believed it. Right? They believed it, and they punched them. They punched back. Miami tried to come out, and my I think Miami got a little bit shook from that fight because I don't think my I think Notre Dame was looking for a fight because they knew what Miami was going to do, mm-hmm. and Miami was so used to people just taking not it. punching back. Yeah, yes, and and uh, and Notre Dame punched back, and and because if you look early in that game, Miami was like doing things, giving up sacks, turning the ball, just things that that uncharacteristic. Were, oh, yeah. yeah, because they were a little shook. They punched back, and Notre Dame said, that's all you got? <laughs> you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Here, we're punching back at you, and it was a great heavyweight fight. Yeah. But they seized it. They had to take it. Yeah, and- because Miami, too. Just think Miami was just – Michigan had the same opportunity weeks before. Did they not? That's right. At they the had big even, house. They had an even bigger lead than Notre Dame did. Yes. That's right. Yes, and they didn't take it because Miami's not – dude. Miami, they thought people thought Miami was just gonna go away. What they were down with 16 or 18 in the fourth quarter or something crazy. And people were turning the channels, like, oh, well, the game in two weeks in South Bend won't mean as much. Miami and Jimmy Johnson said, Okay, we got something for you. We got something for you. <laughs> Stick around. Right. And right. that is it's gonna be fun, man. It's going to be fun. I, I mean, more than fun. Go all the years, man. The Celtics couldn't win a title until they beat the Sixers and Doc. You know what I mean? And the 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 uh, the the Bulls couldn't. The Celt- the Pistons couldn't become the champs until they had to take down the Celtics and the Lakers first, right? The Bulls couldn't become what they became. They had to take down the Pistons. I mean, it, it, it's just that it's never given. It has to be earned. And it's earned by the people that have the right culture, the right talent, and all those things. We, I believe, the Notre Dame has the talent to to get to that level here very soon. We're going to find out if Marcus Freeman has the ability to do that. And same thing with Dan Landing. Same thing with Steve Sarkeesian. And like one of the things we're going to do is the top. This some point in time this off season is the top coaches rankings. Mm. I, you know I love Steve Sarkeesian, but it's nonsense with having him as a top five coach in college football. My guys, he's had one season in nine years, nine ten years with ten or more wins. One. Top like, play caller. <laughs> let's pump the brakes. Now, could he get there? After head coach? The yeah. But let's pump the brakes a little bit on that action right now. Yeah. But it's going to be fun. But, man, I'm, I'm Sean, I'm so excited for this season. There's going to be so many great college football. T- There's going to be weeks where we're doing the show where I'm going to be like, okay, man, let's just fly through this Notre Dame stuff because I can't wait to talk about this. Talk college, college football. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's going to be a lot of fun, and I'm looking forward to it, man, no doubt about it. Yo, we we did have, only we did three have and two three super twenty seven. We have two okay. super chats. Let's quickly bring those up, and we're going to roll. No, no uh, mail back today, but we just have a couple quick super chats. We'll get to before. Hey, Maltavius, thank you for the super chat. Glad to see the RTCF show back. I always love listening to these shows. With the loss of the two NFL bound offensive tackles, how do you think the offensive line fares this year? And who are the two offensive tackles as it stands today? Well, backwards. IB Nation. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, uh, I was about to say his real name. Uh, thank you very much, Maltavius. Uh, as it stands right now, Charles Jagsaw left tackle, Tosh Baker right tackle. There will be a battle at right tackle with Emil Wagner. And and Charles Jagsaw is going to have to build on what he did this year. I mean, if he goes out there and just kind of goes through the motions in spring ball, we may see ourselves with Tosh Baker and Emil Wagner or Gerby Lambert or something like that starting to tackle. I mean, so he's got to build on it. But if he doesn't take a step back, he's the left tackle. There will be a battle at right tackle, in my opinion. Uh, and and it, right now, everybody's assuming it's going to be Emil Wagner and, and – uh, in Tosh Baker, I got my eye on Sullivan Absher. I want to see what Sullivan Absher is going to do this spring, Sean. I want to see if he's able to make some noises, either at tackle. Maybe he's good enough at tackle to where, okay, you're not ready to be that guy. Well, we're going to move you inside and let you battle a guard because mm-hmm. we got to find a way to get you on the field. He's one guy that I have my eye on of maybe making a little bit noise, potentially, potentially could make a little bit of noise this, this spring. Go in the Sun Bowl, that second unit was just as impressive. They were physical. No, they were just as impressive, and he was leading the way. It, dude, he's a big and <laughs> he, he's one of those big boys that tackle guard. I just feel good if he's in that lineup. And I'm I'm Billy Shroff. I'm looking for him to take look, we're being fair and answering the question, but 
something we've been talking about, season a moment. No one exemplifies that more than Charles Jackson. Right. For this and position I, group, yeah. I highly doubt well, that he takes a step back just because of the fact that, yo, when you have to take it and he right. took it. He right. Took it. Because to your point, Sean, Ashton Craig was given an opportunity and, and he, he maximized it. it. Yes. And what I mean by given, he doesn't start the last two games if Zeke Carroll doesn't get hurt. Mm -hmm. Right. It's a little, I mean, and you can say, well, Jagasaw needed Joel to leave. True. But the point is, once Zeke got hurt, Ashton was a center. He, he was going to get that chance. Charles wasn't going to originally be, I was told this by multiple people. We did not go into winter into bowl prep thinking that Charles Jagasaw was going to be starting a left tackle. Yeah. He finished the regular season at guard. He played left guard against Stanford for a couple of plays. He just said, I'm, I'm, I, but I'm going to be, I, yeah. I know that you don't think I'm going to be, but I'm going to be. I was told the first team, the first couple of practices was actually Tosh and Emil, but they were working guys through and giving lots of guys chances. And Charles was just so good that they were like, Oh, we got to keep doing this. And then he just kept doing it. So that's what I'm kind of excited about the O line, Sean. Is you had three mm -hmm. guys that kind of did that a little bit this year for di in different ways. I mean, yeah. Billy Shrouth got thrust in the lineup when Rocco got hurt, mm -hmm. played pretty well. You know, same with Ashton Craig. So you know, can they can they build on that hunger part of it, right? Yeah. How do I think the O line is going to fare? Honestly, that's one of the biggest questions I have about this team on offense. Is that right there? I, I think they're going to have a lot of talent. They're going to be big, but can they play well as a unit? And with them being a pretty young team, a pretty young group, I mean, Jagasaw has one career start. Shrouth and, and Craig have only three career starts. Coogan's your veteran with 13 career starts. You know, Tosh has, what, like two or three, right? I mean, so you don't have a whole lot of experience, and that's a position where experience matters a lot more. So how quickly can they come together? And that's why, you know, I don't like it. I don't like it, it but – it, it benefited them that Joe Walton, Blake Fisher opted out mm -hmm. because it gave yeah. them 15 practices to kind of figure that stuff out. So you're not going into spring ball. This is the first time that Charles Jagasaw, Billy Shrout, Ashton Craig, and Tosh Baker, and Pat Coogan have kind of played together as a unit. And, it, you know, that's is it, the is it fair to say going into this season, let's, you could say O line or offensive tackle, all right? Let's say Jagasaw gets hurt. You feel much better than last season where, oh, if Joe Alt goes down. Yeah, I would say so. Or if Blake – like, right? Well, for two Even reasons. though they're younger and unproven, right. because of the depth and talent right. behind them, it's like you don't yeah. have the same uh-oh feeling that you might have had last season. Part of it is because the drop-off between Jagasaw and the rest isn't as great because he's not Joe Alt yet. Right. The other part, too, is, yes, there you, you do feel that there's guys more ready. So mm -hmm. let's say that he does get hurt. I feel a lot better just moving Tosh over there and Emil stepping in or maybe Sullen Absher's ready for that or Gerby mm -hmm. Lambert is there. You know what I mean? So, yes. Yeah. Same thing in the inside. I mean, you you know, Rocco Spindler is not just going to come back from his injury and be like, ah, well, you know, Billy Strauss a starter and yeah. back to the starter, so I'm just going to enjoy being a backup. Rocco's going to come in a battle. Yeah. Sam Pendleton's not going to look at this and say, well, you know, those guys are there, and I'm just a redshirt freshman, so I'm just going to enjoy another. No, he's going to he's going to battle, and and just overall, Sean, I think they're in a much better position now because last year was a bunch of freshmen and redshirt freshmen. The two deep was nothing but freshmen and redshirt freshmen. Now it's redshirt sophomores, redshirt freshmen, and freshmen. It's just it's just a better situation, in my opinion. And you're going into year two of being under Joe Rudolph, and just that continuity of now you know what the expectations are for him and he did have such a young group, my hope is that we see a similar jump from the O-line like we saw from the D-line under Al Washington and the defense under Al Golden in year two. Here's what I'll say about if I had to make a prediction about the O-line. I think it's going to be a little bit more up and down than we would like it to be. But I think the ups are going to be better than the ups from last year. And I don't think the downs are going to be as down. Not because the talent as much as now Joe Rudolph's it's it they're going to be more used to his way mike denbrock is going to help with that in my opinion providing some leadership but the talent plus that ex continuity is is why i think it's going to be that way in my opinion if, if joe rudolph can coach yeah what this offline what the offensive line will be in november yeah should be scary right right it should that's, be scary come november on. 
Like it's in the scared. postseason is mm-hmm. when – because the thing about the postseason is Notre Dame season is going to end like – I think it's like November 28th or something like that is their last yeah. game. The first round of the playoff doesn't start till December 20th. So there's going to be kind of that resetting period with that young mm-hmm. offensive line that you're going to see as well if they're able to make the playoff. Mm-hmm. But there's going to be – look, just prepare yourself now. Whether it's Northern Illinois or Purdue or Miami, there's going to be a game in that September schedule. Where you're like, what the – Flip and heck is going off the O line. I'm just preparing you for it now. But then the next week they're going to come out a little ticked off and just destroy someone. And that, that just now I hope I'm wrong, but I'm just setting the stage for this is what happens when you have a really young and inexperienced offensive line. Yeah. Because again, it's like if you I like to use the ballet, Sean, or the symphony as as the best examples. The symphony is a good one because. It's more, it's more vision, you know, all you, know, you can hear it, but the ballet is more visual. And, and I think that fits about the offensive line. But if you have a, if you go look at a, a, you know, you see the end product of a ballet, right. Or a play. I like to, I like you know, my wife and I, we go to the, what's I forget what it's called. The Morrison. And we've watched some plays and stuff. Went in Phantom of Opera one time, but like the end product, man, it's just, man, it just, it's so good. Like the symphony's on point and, and everything is just, the, the stage is just things are going up and down. It's, man, it's like, man, that was so good. If you would have watched that the first month that they were working on it, you'd be like, this is going to be a terrible show. That's part because it's the, the everything. It's the timing is so important because we're all working together. And if I miss my mark, it's everyone's going to know it. Just like if I'm the left guard and I'm supposed to block here and I step here, everybody in the stadium's going to see it. But it makes it harder for that continuity because we don't have the thousands and thousands of reps that the 2017 offensive line had together, that they got with so much. I mean, Mustafer, Quinton, McGlinchey, Bars were all starters in 2016. They all went through those wars together. McGlinchey and Q were starters in 2015, right? So you had all the, that work together. 2020 O-line's another example. They weren't very good in 19. They were okay in 18. But part of what made them so good in 20 is they had spent so much time working together, including with Coach Heesan in the offseason. But they just, and they could kind of, they just knew what each other was going to do. That won't happen this year as much. And so you are going to see a little bit of this. Yeah. But I don't think the lows are gonna, like this year, it was this. Next year, I think this year in 2020, it's going to be this. So still the ups and downs, but the lows won't be as low. Yeah. And the highs are going to be higher. Just because of just the overall talent, the year two of the system, and then just the 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 actual system they're going to be executing to me is more suited to what their skill set is, which is downhill, inside zone, and mm-hmm. then all that other stuff is a compliment. They went. We talked about this the other day in the mailbag, Sean. They went way too pin and pull this year, yeah. with guys that aren't pin and pull guys. Right. That hurt the O line this year as well. Then Brock's going to get him back to. We're playing big boy football. Big boy football. And that stuff's complimentary. Yeah. Yes. We're inside it, zone, duo, yeah. and that other stuff, pin and pull, buck sweep, counter. That's all that's all complimentary stuff. We're gonna run it, right? But it's complimenting who we are here. And I think this group is better. So I mean, Billy Shrouth just coming downhill and kicking people's butt is what I want to see. Yeah. Charles Jack can draw Jag- 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 pull, and yeah, of course. I'm we're gonna see him do that. But what I'd rather see him doing is coming down on inside zone, working a double team with Pat Coogan or, Bro- or Rocco or whoever's the left guard and just driving that guy eight yards off the ball. I, I want to see that. That's what I want to see more often than not. Yeah. Right. And, um, and on top of that, you have, look, I think the talent at the running back position has been increased and elevated, oh right? I, that reminds me, it reminds me of the uh, famous NFL films clip. A Marshall Falk runs a touchdown and Dick Vermeil's on the sideline and says, we didn't block anybody on that play. And he's like, dude, he told Marshall Falk, Hey, <laughs> Sorry, we didn't block anybody on that play. Yeah, there. Yo, you have some guys that if you have those type of up and downs, yeah. they still can make a play. Well, that's what made Kyron so good in 2021. Mm-hmm. I mean, his 90 something yard touchdown run against North Carolina was one of the worst blocked plays all year. He got hit four yards behind the line. It was closer to being a safety than it was a 90 something yard touchdown run at first, but he just was like, nah, dude, I'm not going down. Mm-hmm. I'm not going now. I mean, it just, to your point, you've got guys that can do that. And Audric did that this year, but this, this 2024 team is going to have a different, you're going to have the home run speed of multiple players. I mean, little creases can get turned into 
it's a combination of two things. Audric was a great player, but you're going to have more home run speed this year. That that's not debatable. Will they be as good as Audric? That's a different co- conversation. But home run speed wise, they're going to be better. But now you have a quarterback that you have to account for in the RPO game and the read zone game. Mm-hmm. And I point it. I go back to like 2017. I watched that 80 yard touchdown run that Josh Adams had against USC. And the reason that play worked is because Alex Guard absolutely destroyed the three technique. He steps in, guys. Here he needs to get him into the A gap. Alex takes him with his right arm and throws him into the A gap. He cuts right behind it, but that that would have got him five or six yards. The reason it went for 80 is because the will linebacker, the nickel, and the safety were all thinking, I think seven's got the ball. So they work towards Brandon, and that's all that slight hesitation towards Brandon is all Josh Adams needed once mm-hmm. Alex Bars dominated that that three technique to open that sucker up, turn an 80 yard touchdown. Where if you're not, if you if you just got a drop back quarterback there, that will linebacker gives zero F's about the quarterback at that point in time. That he's right there in the hole, taking on Josh Adams. Five yard gain. Great block, Alex Bars. Five yards, second and five. But because you got that quarterback threat to run, now it's 80. Right. And that's that's what I'm excited about with what Mike Denbrock's bringing back because we've seen that. Hey, you're trying to stop CJ Procise and we're running it and, you, and we got cute. So you you commit all your resources stopping CJ. Deshaun Temple pulls it, 75 yard touchdown. Boom. You don't have that this year. You don't. You don't have that in 2021. And, and so that's the thing that's exciting too. And then if you miss wrong, if you guess wrong with these backs, right, the ref's like, mm-hmm. oh, crap, I got to run 80 yards and I'm going to be so worn out after this play, right? I mean, that's that's the exciting. I mean, CJ, I think CJ Procise in 2015, man, you, you block that counter play up and once he gets through the first level, peace. Mm-hmm. You've got that kind of home run ability. Are they are they the every down bass Audric word? I don't know about that. But man, the, the talent is really impressive. All right, last one, and then we're gonna get out of here. Thank you for the super chat. Lou Holtz Thunder in boats. Several folks have hinted at facility upgrades, the Google re- renovation. When could this actually happen? In your opinion, how will this impact the program? Well, it, it's it, there's gonna be a lot more meeting space from what I'm told. There's going to be a lot of uh, upgrades in the strength and conditioning program, the, the weight room, things like that, which is going to bend the f- program that way. My understanding is there's going to be places to cook now in the facility so meals can be prepared there, which is Brian Kelly made very clear. That's the only reason he didn't win a national championship because he didn't have a chef in the building. Um, I haven't been on the petty train enough yet today, Sean, so I had to do it before we end here. Uh, but, but I mean, it, can there are advantages to that. Right. I, I, I joke, but that's that's a needed thing. I just my point was that's not why you chose to go for two when you're already up 11 against Northwestern. OK, um, but anyway, things like that, more meeting space, uh, more room for the players to come over and, and, and do certain things, you know, I'm you know, study wise, things like that. I mean, and then it's going to look cooler. Which, from a recruiting standpoint, is always good. I mean, let's be honest. When when all of us were 16, 17, and 18, we were a lot more impressed with shiny objects than we are now. I mean, at least hopefully. Hopefully we've all matured enough to where we just don't, ooh, you know what I mean? Or we may be impressed by it now, but now as 40-something-year-olds, we realize it really doesn't matter. <laughs> it's cool looking, but I'm not making any life-altering decisions based off of it. Where at 18, Sean, you and I both know this. <laughs> We made a lot of dumb decisions because of how things looked. You know what I mean? Like, I want that car because it looks cool, but it doesn't function in the city you live in. You know what I mean? Like, you live in Pittsburgh. You live on Mount Washington. You should not have a sports car. I say that experience because I had a Mustang living in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, on Mount Washington. Not smart. (laughs) Right? Looked cool. Practically stupid. Right? So, I don't make that mistake at 45. You know what I'm saying? So, uh, but it, it'll it'll be cool. And and but there are legitimate benefits from a a, a space standpoint, a strength standpoint, a, a a meal, a nutrition standpoint, a a place to do your thing standpoint. There will be a lot of benefits, in in my opinion, to the renovations of the Goog. So that'll be pretty cool. All right, Sean. That's it. A quick reminder, folks. Our TCFs are not going to normally be this late. We only did it this week because we wanted to wait till Elijah Burris made his decision so we could talk about it. But normally it'll be 
more of an earlier afternoon show. Mr. Davis, take us out of here, buddy. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us today on the RTCF show. Hopefully it's the first of many leading up to the season, a successful season in 2024. Once you go to YouTube, make sure you subscribe, share, hit the like button, and hit the notification bell. Every time we go live, you'll know. And then if you want to get involved, you need to sign up for the message board over at boardsirisbreakdown.com for recruiting information, intel, and great conversations amongst the fans, similar to what we had today in the chat. Great show. Way to kick it off, Brian. And I can't wait until next week for more with the RTCF show where we talk recruiting, team, and college football. So for Brian Driscoll, I'm Sean Davis. Thank you for joining us today on the Irish Breakdown Podcast. Have a great evening.